these hospitals, clinics, whatever. Now in Rwanda, the the yield on that was just enormous, right? Uh, just to give one example, the hospital in the northern part of Rwanda. Yeah. So that's a beautiful hospital. Partners in Health bit, built it. Um, it cost four point three million dollars, which is not a lot for a hundred and fifty bed hospital. Um, that would wouldn't even get you a Starbucks building in New York. Um, and within one year of building it, the Rwandan government was paying 70% of all the salaries. And so that allows you to go deep and to build up, to take those private resources that are private capital can move more quickly than public capital. Much of Dr. Farmer's work is in some of the poorest nations and areas around the world. But that work has given him a special perspective on the U.S. healthcare system. And he says we may actually be able to learn from places like Haiti. I think most Americans know that we spend a really big fraction of our GDP on healthcare. It's over 18%, I think. And there, there's no doubt that we're not getting value for that kind of investment. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, there's a very weak health system here, the system itself. When someone needs a heart transplant or any major surgical procedure, we, we've got that covered. We, we, on biotech development, new therapeutics, the Americans are, are we're way, way ahead in many ways. The system itself is weak, however. And one of the primary weaknesses, uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say the primary weakness, is that we don't attend enough to preventing adverse outcomes among those who are already sick. So what do we need? Well, we learned in Haiti and then Rwanda that if you have community health workers who actually help people in their homes or places of work, that you're going to get improved clinical outcomes. One of the reasons that in the United States we work with the Navajo Nation um, is because we don't have to argue about that with them. They have had community health workers for decades, 60, 70 years. So we knew we wouldn't have to go through the same arguments and it was about financing these petty small salaries. These are underpaid people and there should be literally millions of them in the United States helping move care from hospitals and even clinics home. We're starting to hear that here in the United States as well. Really? Yeah. I mean, some of the major funders, uh, you know, I mentioned the Gates Foundation or the Gateses, Warren Buffett, other people who paid attention to this are, are saying, hey, how, how, how should we do this in the United States? That was Dr. Paul Farmer. He's co-founder of Partners in Health. And you can watch the full interview with Dr. Farmer on Big Decisions that premieres tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time right here on Bloomberg Television. Coming up now, Balance of Power will continue on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to have more with Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy. We'll also talk trade with Chris Kruger. He's a policy analyst at Cowan Washington Research Group. This is Balance of Power. We are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is a Bloomberg Pursuits look at luxury. New York's billionaire's row is living up to its name. More houses were bought for north of $25 million on Manhattan's 57th Street in the last five years than on any other road in the world, including Mount Nicholson Road in Hong Kong's Peak District, where the average sale price tops $81.8 million. Manhattan has seen a glut of super luxury developments in the past five years as developers take advantage of leaps in engineering that have allowed pencil-thin towers to be built on modest plots. In collecting news, a rare World War II Enigma machine used by Nazi Germany to create military communications code thought to be unbreakable sold at auction for more than $106,000. Also making auction news, Babe Ruth's 500th home run bat has sold again for more than a million dollars. The 45-ounce wooden bat was used for Ruth's first home run on opening day of the then brand new Yankee Stadium in 1923. I'm Joan Doniger, Bloomberg Radio. Full breakfast, cup of coffee, whatever you have in the morning, have it at daybreak. Event risk is taking center stage for traders. Nathan Hager. We get a policy decision from the Federal Reserve. And Karen Moscow. It is the fifth major industry player to make some sort of zero commission offer. Bloomberg Daybreak. Bloomberg has more from Hong Kong. Weekdays at 5 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. 
Bloomberg, the world is listening. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Elite advisory firms rely on BNY Mellon's Pershing to meet the needs of their most complex clients. Karen Novak, Chief Operating Officer at Pershing Advisor Solutions, explains how. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, we bring customized insights and strategies to help you grow your advisory business and stay on the leading edge. We can support the needs of your most sophisticated clients with a full range of investment and wealth management solutions from access to private banking to consolidated bank and brokerage custody. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength and high-touch service that BNY Mellon's Pershing can provide. Are you well positioned to stand out from your competition? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Brokerage custody provided by Pershing LLC and other services provided by Pershing Advisor Solutions LLC. Both members of FINRA and SIPC. Private banking and bank custody provided by BNY Mellon NA. Member FDIC. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, this is Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks struggling to hold on to gains. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, they are all higher. Little change, though. That's the key takeaway on this Wednesday. We've got the S&P up one point right now, 3194, up by less than one-tenth of one percent. This, by the way, the final full trading week of 2019. The Dow up four points, also little change. NASDAQ up 19. That's a gain of two-tenths of one percent. Investors aren't digesting a flurry of corporate news. Impeachment is looming and trade worries are retreating. Treasuries are slipping, the pound weakening. Right now we've got the tenure down 14.30 seconds, the yield 1.92%. Gold down one-tenth of one percent, lower by a dollar twenty-six the ounce at 14.74. And West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is higher now by three-tenths of one percent, 61.10 a barrel, Brent 66.32. That is a gain of three-tenths of one percent. FedEx shares are plus. 10.3% as the parcel company lowered its profit forecast for the year and reported quarterly results below expectations, prompting Wall Street analysts to wonder if the situation can worsen. Lee Klaskow is a senior logistics analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. The good news is that volumes are going into their network from other e-commerce providers that view uh, FedEx as a value proposition and and a higher uh, or faster uh, uh, transit times. Uh, So we should see volume kind of increase uh, into to their network. Uh, the bad news for that, though, is it tends to be B2C business. B2C uh, uh, tends to have lower margins and lower yields, so you're going to have a negative mix shift. Business to consumer, uh, we've got FedEx uh, down 10.2%. UPS shares dropping now by 1.9%. And among the companies scheduled to report after the bell, Micron Technology uh, shares lower now by three-tenths of 1%. High Ridge Brands, owner of faded consumer names like Zest Soap and VO5 Shampoo, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in Delaware with plans to sell itself in a court-supervised process. Again, recapping here. S&P higher by two points, a little changed, up one-tenth of one percent. It is 102 on Wall Street. Time now for the Market Drivers Report with a focus on American depository receipts. And here is Dave Wilson. Thanks, Charlie. ADRs are lower, unlike U.S. shares. The S&P ADR index is down about a tenth of a percent. And the S&P 500 is up about a tenth of a percent. Belgium's Galapagos has lost 3.6% in U.S. trading. The drug developer was cut to neutral from buy at Citigroup, which doesn't see anything coming soon to lift the price. Galapagos ADRs had soared as much as 138% this year. Cyprus-based Kiwi has uh, fallen 12%. CEO Sergey Salonen and Chairman Boris Kim will effectively swap positions at the payment processor next month. Salonen had headed the company since 2012, the year before its initial public offering here in the U.S. 
South Africa's MTN Group has risen 4% after completing a board transition. Former South African Deputy Finance Minister M. Sabisi Jonas became chairman of the mobile phone company. Uh, he succeeded former CEO Futuma Nenleko, who stepped down. Argentine ADRs are higher after new President Alberto Fernandez proposed higher export tariffs and other actions to address the country's debt burden. Among financial stocks, uh, Galicia has climbed 6.8% in U.S. trading, uh, and Banco Macro has gained 7.7%, and energy producer YPF has risen 5%, Charlie. And we thank you very much, Dave Wilson. Again, recapping here, the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ, all higher, little change. S&P up two points, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Balance of Power. We have the strongest economy by far in the world. We're going to grow our trade relationship. I know what's broken. I know how to fix it. Where the world of politics meets the world of business. They've got the money they need to run a very competitive race. We've got now a real crunch few days for Brexit. We want certainty in the markets. We want certainty in our trading relationships. The administration is trying to create a new divided world. Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Radio. The House debates impeachment with an historic vote due later this evening. We continue to wait for the details of the Phase 1 agreement with China, and Alaska adapts to lower oil prices and increased competition from shale. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, welcome to the second hour of Balance of Power. Oil has been a huge benefit to the state of Alaska, allowing it to pay its citizens an annual stipend. But that stipend has come under pressure from lower oil prices and increased competition from shale production in the lower 48. Governor Mike Dunleavy of Alaska is still with us. Thank you so much for staying with us here, Governor. Give us a sense of where oil is with Alaska today. Uh, thanks for having me, David. Well, oil's been a mainstay for Alaska, as we know, for about 40 years. Um, just last week, we pumped our 18th billion barrel of oil through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline system. And um, we still have a pretty good future in oil, Alaska does. We're pumping currently now at about uh, 530,000 barrels of oil through the light pipeline per day. That's that's a quarter full, uh, quarter full now. We used to pump about 2 million barrels uh, excuse me, yeah, uh, 2 million barrels per day. So we um, we are having a renaissance on the North Slope, though. We've got new investment of over $4.5 billion in the last couple of years. Uh, more pools of oil are being found, and this is conventional oil. So we have conventional pools of oil. We have the capacity in the pipeline to ship it, and we have a great port in Valdez to ship it out through the Pacific. We don't cross any other state lines or sovereign uh, lines such as Canada. So we have a, a clear uh, shipping point to the rest of the world. And so we're pretty bullish on the future of Alaska when it comes to uh, oil, as well as gas and other minerals. We hear an awful lot about investment in the Permian Basin and other places for shale. There's a lot of investment going in there. What's the investment situation in Alaska? Are, uh, is there a lot of investment coming into oil and gas now? Yeah, over the last two, two and a half years, as mentioned, about 4.5 to $5 billion worth uh, uh, of new investment on the North Slope. So folks are, uh, there are a number of companies that are bullish. We've got ConocoPhillips, as we know, Exxon in Alaska, uh, Hill Corp, Oil Search, uh, E&I, uh, a number of explorers, a number of developers. So we have both uh, Greenfield and Brownfield um, presence in Alaska. And we're anticipating uh, going from about 530,000 barrels per day upwards of 700,000, uh, potentially 700,000 plus here over the next five to seven years. So things are looking pretty good in terms of production, and that's what we want to have happen. You mentioned ConocoPhillips, and as I understand, ConocoPhillips is involved in one, on one side of sort of a dispute in Alaska right now, which is about this this uh, income tax, either credit or deduction, depending on how you kind of construe it, which uh, basically you will rebate some of the money to oil companies depending on whether it's below $80 a barrel or not. There's some people saying we should do away with that or cut back on that because you do have some budget pressures. Where is that campaign right now? So that's a, that's a citizen's initiative that's looking at changing our tax structure for oil. And um, our, our administration is studying this, this initiative. It doesn't go through the legislature. It actually comes from the people itself. And we just want to make sure that whatever occurs in Alaska is something that benefits the state of Alaska, the people of Alaska, and that we have to make sure that our investment uh, keeps coming to Alaska, that we don't do anything that uh, will turn that investment away. So we're taking a look at that. When you say it's a citizen's initiative, I'm not familiar with it. Is that like a referendum? Do they have yes. to vote on it? Yes. They, they put it together. Uh, petition is put together by the citizens. Uh, they, if they get enough signatures, it goes on the ballot. And then the people of Alaska vote on it. So it bypasses the legislature legislature and the governor. And um, once again, this is a big discussion this year, and we have to see how this, uh, this uh, uh, plays out. But again, we have to make sure 
that our investment prospects uh, stay positive in Alaska. So we're taking a look at this, uh, this initiative very closely. Climate change is something on the minds of an awful lot of governors and people across the country. Uh, and we recently had Jay Johnson on. He's the former Secretary of Homeland Security. And I asked him, what's the biggest national security threat? And he surprised me, frankly, by saying it's climate change because of the possible effect on infrastructure. My top three threats to our security are climate change, climate change, climate change. Severe weather impact on aging infrastructure, in particular, uh, present, in my judgment, a security threat. Not just a threat to our environment, but a security threat. So, uh, Governor, what is it like up in Alaska? Are you seeing effects on infrastructure from changes in climate? So we've, we've always had to deal with permafrost in the state of Alaska. And we are, uh, interestingly enough, we are a, a wet state, even though we're a western, we're a northern state as well. Um, we have a lot of water in Alaska. But we've always had to deal with uh, uh, the, infra, uh, the, uh, the permafrost issue in terms of engineering buildings, engineering roads and bridges. And there's no doubt that things are warming up. And so we're going to have to take a look at... Um, how that is impacting our roads and our bridges. Right now, uh, we, uh, we, we, we think we, uh, we are managing things in terms of infrastructure, but we also have to make sure that some of our coastal communities that are being impacted by um, a changing ice and weather patterns as well as rivers that are changing course, uh, those, some of those communities are being impacted, and we're going we're gonna to have to have a conversation as to how we're going to deal with that going into the future. And, and finally, Governor, uh, tell us about education, because there's a lot of talk, certainly in Washington and other places, about rural education sort of falling farther behind. What's the situation in Alaska? So we have, uh, you know, we have a very large state. Uh, we're two and a half times the size of Texas. We used to have four time zones and um, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So we do have a number of remote, isolated communities that uh, in, in many cases our, our kids aren't performing as well as we'd hope. So this year we're going to be rolling out some initiatives to deal with that. And one is that we're going to uh, put in place some legislation that will ensure that all kids are reading by third grade. We're putting in uh, legislation to make sure that... Um, our students are proficient in algebra by the time they leave eighth grade because algebra is also a gatekeeper course for sciences, mathematics, engineering. And um, we're going to be working with our tribes. We have a, a large uh, native population in Alaska. About 15% of our people are Alaskan native. We're going to be working with the tribes to ensure that they're part of the educational process so that we have a better chance of having our kids perform better and succeed better. There's a debate certainly on the East Coast about how much of this is resources and how much of this is, uh, is approach. What is it for you in Alaska when it comes to education? Is it more money needed or is it a different approach I, I believe that uh, I believe that first we need to look at the approach we need to look at uh, are we really focusing on reading are we using our best practices research based approaches to reading I think we need to go there first but um, we're also looking at adding some more resources uh, to uh, to this approach on reading we'll be adding resources for reading specialists so it's probably a combination of both but you right. certainly have to look at the approach to make sure you get the outcomes that you want governor thank you so very much for being with us today it's really been a pleasure that's Governor Mike Dunleavy of Alaska. The House, in the meantime, is debating two articles of impeachment against President Trump, even as we speak, with a vote due later today. We talk with our congressional correspondent about tough decisions coming up today. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. What do you count? Interest rates? If you get marginally higher interest rates, does that bring the P.E. multiple in? Trade figures? China driving a tectonic shift in the availability of money. Employment data? What is happening with the headcount? You could just leave all that to us. Is it the one and done tariff adjustment? Tom Keen and Jonathan Farrell, right where it counts. Bloomberg Surveillance, weekday mornings at 7 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. You're fierce. You take care of business and don't hold back. Taking care of your health shouldn't be any different. You know when something's off. Don't ignore symptoms like fatigue, joint pain, and rashes. Listen to your body. It could be lupus. We're here to help you take control. Learn how at BeFierceTakeControl.org. Brought to you by the Lupus Foundation of America and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. What if you could keep the top economic experts in a conference room next to your office without having to feed them? Do we need better optics? Do we need some substance? Do CEOs care about ESG? We have seen quite a lot of stimulus pumped into the system already. It's the biggest warning yet about the financial risks of climate change. Now, there are more ways to hear us. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com and iHeartRadio apps, and at BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, 
The world is listening. You took the first step and quit smoking, but even former smokers may still be at risk for lung cancer. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know about a new low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early. It takes only 60 seconds and could save your life. You took the first step, now take the next. Visit SaveByTheScan.org for a simple quiz to see if you're eligible and talk to your doctor about screening. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12-megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36-month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, term supply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn, with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk... The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, Greta Gerwig on bringing Louisa May Alcott's novel Little Women to the big screen. Women have all kinds of practice imagining themselves as men, and men have very little practice imagining themselves as women. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial-free. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown! It is college football bowl season on TuneIn. This Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, the bowl season kicks off from the beautiful Bahamas. Back to throw, fires, run the slam, caught, touchdown! The Charlotte 49ers will be playing their first bowl game in school history. They'll be matched up against the Buffalo Bulls. Don't miss the first bowl game of the season. To listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown again. Search NFL today. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest additions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ holding on to gains as investors digest a flurry of corporate news, impeachment looms, and trade worries retreat. Treasuries are slipping. We've got the tenure down 14, 30 seconds. The yield 1.92%. S&P up three points, 31.95 right now. That is 
gain of one-tenth of one percent. The Dow up 17 points. Has been meandering, but up now by just about one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ up 21, a gain there of two-tenths of one percent. Gold down one-tenth of one percent, 1474 the ounce. And crude oil, West Texas Intermediate up three-tenths of one percent, 6114. Brent crude, 6634. That's a gain of four-tenths of one percent. So again, recapping, stocks higher, S&P up three, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thanks so much, Charlie Pellet. From the Interactive Broker Studio, this is Balance of Power. The House of Representatives is expected to impeach President Trump later today, with the vote likely to break down along party lines. But the pressure is particularly intense for some Democrats, many of them in their first year, who come from districts that voted for President Trump in 2016. And President Trump has done nothing to relieve that pressure, claiming he's benefiting in the swing states from the move to impeach him. This is what he said on Fox News. If you look at those swing states, I'm way up in every one of them because of the impeachment thing. And it's crazy what's going on because the people get it. It's a hoax. Welcome now, Sahil Kapoor, who covers Congress for Bloomberg in Washington. So, Sahil, you're covering this very closely. How much pressure is there on those swing state Democrats? Sahil? Because, as you mentioned, hey, David, can you hear me? I can now, yeah. Okay, uh, there, there is plenty of pressure on them because, as you mentioned, their districts are uh, closely divided or leaning toward President Trump. But for the most part, every Democrat at this point is expected to vote to impeach the president except two of them. One of them is Colin Peterson of Minnesota, who represents the most Republican-leaning district of any Democrat. The second is Jeff Van Drew, a freshman from New Jersey, who is expected to switch parties and become a Republican. He has not announced that yet, but that is widely expected and reported. So those are the only two Democrats who voted against beginning the procedure, um, beginning the inquiry and beginning the procedure today to set up six hours of debate. So some of the Democrats that we're talking about, I'll pick one, Alyssa Slotkin, uh, who comes from uh, Michigan, uh, has come under some stress from her own constituents. She went out and had a town hall meeting. We heard it. And uh, some people supported her. Some people really booed her. And she said it might cost her her job. What has been the reaction overall from those uh, those Trump-leaning districts where Democrats are serving? These Democrats are, have a, quite a dilemma on their hands, and Alyssa Slotkin is a good example of this because her district is very divided. Uh, there are clearly plenty of Democrats in that district where she wouldn't have gotten elected. Um, for her and many other Democrats, they say this is their civic duty. This is not about politics, that the president has committed abuses and impeachable offenses, that he's abused his power in a way that they feel compelled to cast this vote. So the line from Democrats that you're hearing overwhelmingly from Speaker Pelosi on down is that nobody's happy about this, they're not cheering this, this is a solemn day, but that they believe it is their duty uh, and, 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 you know, part of their oath uh, to take this vote and to impeach the president, put him on trial for high crimes and misdemeanors. So, Hill, even if it's not popular with at least a significant portion of the constituency, it's not clear exactly what they'll be voting on come November, because we've some, seen some ads from people in Congress already don't talk about impeachment at all. They talk about more basic things like health care and uh, other sort of pocketbook issues as they were. Do we have a sense of what they're likely to vote on come November? Well, that's absolutely right. Uh, impeachment and other issues like the president's handling of uh, the Russia investigation and, uh, you know, what he's done with potential obstruction of justice there have not been big concerns for voters. These have dominated the conversation in Washington, D.C., because they're important issues. But voters are much more concerned, as you point out, about pocketbook issues, about uh, about median wages, about health care, about education, paying their kids' college tuition, that sort of thing. And that is likely to continue. I, I'd be very surprised if uh, the 2020 elections ultimately become about impeachment as the top issue. But there are certainly some people who will try. For instance, you know, a, a, the deep Republican opponent of someone like Kendra Horn, which is uh, a first-term Democrat who won a district that President Trump won in 2016 by 16 points. I'm sorry, 13 points. So there will be some Republicans who try to make uh, impeachment the issue in the 2020 election. But for most voters, I doubt that's going to be the case. So, Hill, do you have a sense of whether President Trump was right in what he told Fox News when he said he's way up in the swing states because of the impeachment thing? Do we have a sense of how he's doing in places like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania compared to 2016? There's not much evidence that his numbers have gone up uh, since the impeachment inquiry. 
uh, began. What what we've seen is the country used to be opposed, a significant majority of the country used to be opposed to impeaching the president, but then Speaker Pelosi announced her decision in late September, the polls shot up, and have been more or less in a dead heat uh, in terms of opposition and support for impeachment since then. Now, there's some anecdotal evidence um, that, you know, the, the president's approval rating is ticking up by a few points here. Some polls show that he's about flat. Um, but we haven't seen a preponderance of evidence to really conclude that the impeachment in, uh, inquiry is benefiting him politically. And one of the things that has been remarked upon is his uh, approval rating, which uh, what I've seen has been around 42, 43 percent. You say it may have ticked up a little bit. Um, it is underperforming where one would have thought, given where the economy is, where unemployment is, where inflation is. What is the explanation for that gap, if indeed there is a gap? Well, the explanation is he is... A unpopular personally to many people who might be supportive of his economic performance. He rates highly on, uh, you know, when, when people are asked, you approve or disapprove of the president's handling of the economy. But on just about every other issue and on personal quality, whether it's character, trustworthiness, uh, leadership, are you setting a good example for children? Uh, do, do people feel like he cares about them personally? He scores poorly on all of those issues. So the economy is the main thing that's holding him up. It is uh, very good right now if you look at the stock market and unemployment uh, at least. But those other things, those other things that he does, his rhetoric, his you know political toxicity with many voters based, uh, based on his uh, behavior is what is dragging him down. We have a- almost a year to go still until the elections. And as we know, a year is several lifetimes in politics. But at this point, are the Democrats concerned about holding the House... At this point, I don't believe that is the case. Democrats are certainly concerned about losing some seats, some seats in very Republican-leaning areas, some seats in very uh, Trump-leaning districts. That is certainly a concern, and the the magnitude of the 2018 wave suggests that Democrats will almost certainly lose some seats, Mm -hmm. but they have to lose quite a few to, to, you know, to surrender the majority, and they seem, the consensus on both ends seems uh, to be that Democrats will keep the majority at this point. The question is how big will it be, and will things really go south to the point where it's threatened? Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg Sahil Kapoor. If the House does impeach President Trump, he's going to be tried in the Senate, with some Republican senators saying they don't see any reason to convict him. We're going to talk with Robert Mints of McCarter English next. That's on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. This is a Bloomberg Market Minute. U.S. stocks are modestly higher. The Dow is up 10 points, S&P 500 up 2, the Nasdaq up 20 points. Highbridge Brands, the maker of Zest, VO5, and other household brands, is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and plans to sell itself. Highbridge Brands lists at least $500 million in liabilities. New York Life is buying Cigna Life and Disability Insurance business for more than $6 billion. Cigna wants to pay down debt and focus on its core business, employer health benefits. And get your credit cards ready. A lot of retail analysts say this Super Saturday, the last Saturday before Christmas, will be the biggest shopping day this year. Customer Growth Partners tells Reuters the firm expects us to spend $34 billion. Donna Wilson, Bloomberg Radio. Melissa from Michigan. I work an extra part-time job serving lunch at my child's school, but I still can't afford to put food on our table. Daniel from California. Choosing whether to pay the rent or pay to fix the car to get to work doesn't leave us with much at all. Now we can't even pay for meals. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. The market's in focus every business day. The P&L Podcast with Paul Sweeney and Lisa Abramowitz. Are there some sectors that you want to have more or less exposure to? What's behind this engine of gains? Analysis of the day's Wall Street action. The U.S. market looks relatively safe. From Bloomberg Intelligence, Bloomberg Opinion, and Influential Newsmakers. Ward McCarthy joins us right now. P&L with Paul Sweeney and Lisa Abramowitz. Listen today on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. 
Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. And somehow I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> It was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here. Testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. What was your favorite binge-worthy podcast of 2019? Here's one of ours. Not so long ago, Stanford dropout turned CEO Elizabeth Holmes was a rising star in Silicon Valley. On The Dropout, ABC News reporter Rebecca Jarvis tells the unbelievable true story of Elizabeth Holmes, who went from being the world's youngest self-made female billionaire to facing 20 years in prison. Her company, Theranos, was poised to change healthcare forever. She would have been the next new job. Search a dropout on TuneIn to hear what the hype is all about. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown again. Search NFL today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Hey, NFL fan. Can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown to Canada. Search NFL today. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Four of the league's top teams are in action as the Lakers take on the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, followed by the Rockets taking on the Clippers at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. 11-2! This Thursday, the Lakers are at the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, and the Rockets are at the Clippers, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. Coming up on Balance of Power, with an impeachment trial looming in the Senate, is the result a foregone conclusion? And should it be? We talk with Robert Mintz of McCarter and English. But first, let's get a market check with Charlie Pellet. And I thank you very much, David Weston. A happy Wednesday. We have got the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, 
all higher, but stocks are struggling to hold on to gains as investors digest a flurry of corporate news, impeachment looms, and trade worries retreat. S&P 500 index uh, right now is up two points, up by one-tenth of one percent. This gain coming after reaching another record amid positive factory and housing data. The S&P now at 3,194, on track for a record close. The Dow also at a record up seven. Little changed, up less than one-tenth of one percent, while NASDAQ is up 17. A gain there of two tenths of one percent. The White House is touting a trade deal that promises to double U.S. exports to China over two years, but there is a catch, as we hear from Bloomberg's Vinny Del Judice. The trade war isn't over. That promised two hundred billion dollar Chinese buying spree, if it happens, probably won't make up for the damage inflicted on America's economy. It's tough to tally the cost of a conflict that's far from over. Bloomberg Economics estimates that the trade dispute has so far cost the U.S. $134 billion in lost economic output and cautions the cost could top $300 billion by the end of next year. Beneath Dell, Judice Bloomberg Radio. FedEx shares lower as the parcel company lowers its profit forecast for the year and reports quarterly results below expectations, prompting Wall Street analysts to wonder if the situation can worsen. FedEx shares down now by 10.2%. Among the companies scheduled to report after the closing bell today, Micron Technology, Micron now lower or by five-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Balance of power continues once again. Here he is your host, David Weston. Thank you so much, Charlie Pellet. President Trump admits that he talked with Ukrainian President Zelensky about investigating former President Biden. He's even proud of it. So what's lacking in the impeachment case against him? When we talked with Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio today, he said he hadn't made up his mind, but had yet to see the case made. That's how I go into it, saying what I've heard so far, I, I, I don't see the evidence that leads to that. However, uh, as you say, I am a juror, and I'm keeping an open mind, and I'm listening, and we will continue to hear uh, what the House managers, which is the Democrats, will present. Uh, we'll also hear what the president's team will present, because now they'll have a chance to present their side of, of, of the argument. We welcome now Robert Mintz, head of White Collar Criminal Investigations at McCarter and English. So, Mr. Mintz, thank you so much for joining us. Let me ask you to play, I don't know if it's the red team or the blue team, but, but let's just go through what perhaps a Rob Portman might need to see. What more should he see than what he saw in that transcript? Well, the standard of proof here is really very much in the eye of the beholder at the end of the day. Let's remember that the standard of proof in this trial that will take place in the Senate is not like a criminal trial. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not even a preponderance of the evidence. What the Constitution says, it is whatever the members of the Senate believe is necessary to re remove a president. So it seems right, like at this point, depending upon which side of the aisle you sit, uh, there's either overwhelming evidence or there's no clear connection between the president asking for this favor for the, from the president of Ukraine to conduct this investigation into the Bidens and to look into the source of the um, break-in of the Democratic uh, Committee's uh, emails. So to do that and to hold up the $400 million in military aid in exchange for those requests, which were arguably more to benefit his own political interests than uh, to seek out and uh, root out corruption in Ukraine. So you've, you've seen a lot of a criminal work done in your day. Uh, do you typically have a transcript where the person who's being accused says, and by the way, let me make this really clear to you, I'm not going to do this unless you do that. Because in the transcript, President Trump did talk at some length about the aid, uh, and then he did turn around and say, I want you to do me a favor. Uh, if this were, and it's not, as you point out, if this were a regular uh, a criminal conspiracy alleged, would you need more proof than this? That's a great question, because in criminal cases, there's two kinds of evidence. There's what's called direct evidence, which is an eyewitness or a statement, an admission that's made by a witness or a recording where somebody admits to wrongdoing. And then there's something else called circumstantial evidence, which is uh, where, where there's evidence of some kind of guilt, some kind of consciousness of guilt that's not direct, but it can be reasonably concluded um, by uh, evidence that sort of surrounds that. And at the end of a trial, a judge will instruct a jury that circumstantial evidence is to be given the same weight as direct evidence. It's no less powerful. And so to answer your question directly, yes, there's criminal cases where all the time, you know, we have cases where there's convictions that are built largely circumstantially. There's not always direct 
evidence of somebody's guilt here. So certainly the Democrats are going to argue that there is overwhelming circumstantial evidence, even though the president did not expressly say that unless you give me what I'm looking for, these investigations, I'm not going to give you the military aid that the, that the Congress has already approved. If we go into circumstantial evidence, which sounds inevitable, uh, do we also have to take into account the fact that perhaps not Vice President Biden, I've seen no indication that he was involved in this, but his son, Hunter Biden, uh, you could make a colorable clay, case, at least, that there may have been corruption there. Well, that is something that Republicans are going to want to get into, but the trap door, door into that is once you start broadening this in order to bring in Hunter Biden, then it also opens the door, I think, into allowing the Democrats to try to bring in some of these witnesses who they tried to get appear before the House Intelligence Committee but who refused to appear. So I think that Republicans are ultimately going to streamline this as much as possible. You've already heard the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell say that we are not going to do the investigation for the House. That was their job. If they haven't called all the evidence, put all the evidence together to make an overwhelming case, if they haven't produced witnesses that produce uh, that show direct evidence of the president's culpability here, we're not going to do it on the Senate side. And that's the battle here of or not whether they're going to call witnesses or whether the House uh, is simply going to have to present testimony that they had already uh, obtained through the hearings in the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Committee on the House side. If there were more direct evidence, would it be really going to the president's intent? Is that what might be lacking here from, uh, again, Senator Portman's point of view? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, if you listen to the senators who say that they're continuing to think about this and, re- and have an open mind on this, they, they don't have people who were communicating directly with the president and and get into the president's mind here. You know, as, as with all criminal cases, at least, it, it always becomes a question of intent. There's proving the facts, uh, with the, the conduct that somebody actually engaged in, and then in order to prove culpability, criminal culpability, you have to show that it was done willfully and for some bad reason here. So you have to get inside the head of the uh, alleged defendant here and try to figure out what they meant by what they were doing. People who had direct communications with the president are mainly those witnesses who have refused to appear before the House. And that's basically the situation we're in, where the Republicans are saying we don't have enough evidence. The Democrats are saying, well, we would have more evidence if those people came to testify. And that's why we have the standoff that we have today. Uh, there's a further complicating factor perhaps here, which is, in fact, the aid was eventually released. It wasn't withheld. And, and for that matter, I think the investigation by the Ukrainians wasn't ev- actually done. Now, perhaps legally uh, to ent- to attempt it may be sufficient, but I wonder if that's sufficient for a high crime or misdemeanor. Well, yeah, and that's another great point. I mean, that is certainly one of the things Republicans point to. They say, at the end of the day, the aid was released and the investigation never occurred. So whatever it was that the president may have been seeking, whether it was directly, indirectly, whether it was a quid pro quo, whether it was just a simply unrelated request, it never happened. And Democrats will argue, well, it only didn't happen because he got caught. And in a criminal context, certainly that would be enough to convict somebody. If you go to rob a bank and before you actually can pull it off, you get arrested by the by the police, um, you're, you're as guilty as if you had carried out the crime. So it really is the same for a criminal standpoint. But again, it's not a criminal case. This is an attempt to remove a president from office. And I think Republicans think that there's got to be more than what they're seeing right now. And finally, Robert, is this the end of it? Uh, let's assume for the moment he's impeached, which looks likely today. Let's assume that he's acquitted in the Senate, which looks likely in January. We still have things like the the, the Don McGahn uh, subpoena out there involving the Mueller allegations. We've got the Monuments investigation. Is this the end of it? Well, it probably isn't. Uh, and, and on top of that, we have the uh, appeal going up to the Supreme Court on the president's tax return. Yep. So there are there's more information that's going to come out ultimately down the road, depending upon how, how the courts rule on these on these various cases. Um, and then depending upon what happens, if Don McGahn is forced to testify, if the subpoena, if the subpoena for tax returns ultimately uh, prevails, um, we'll get more information. Now, what the Democrats might do with that at that point is anybody's yep. guess. It's not over till it's over. Okay, thanks very much to Robert Mintz from McCarter in English. Last week was a big one for U.S. trade with agreements reached between the administration and Congress and USMCA and between the U.S. and China. We talked with Chris Kruger of Cowan about that and what comes next. This is Balance of Power and we are on Bloomberg Radio. 
Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, President of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, we understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best-in-class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at seic.com slash seize change. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. In-depth analysis. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer. And the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Our Christmas, a time for celebrating, unwrapping and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone success with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut. The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good. On Search the NBA plus. today to start listening. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Back to throw, fires, run of the slant, caught, touchdown. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown. This Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, the lights shine bright on the Las Vegas Bowl. Washington Huskies head coach Chris Peterson will coach his final game before retiring as he takes on his former school, the Boise State Broncos. Down to the five, he leaps for the end zone, and he is in. To listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. 
touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, tune in listeners, Steve Kornacki here from NBC News. I want to tell you about a podcast I'm hosting called Article 2, Inside Impeachment. It's dedicated to bringing you the latest developments on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk to NBC News reporters who are closest to the story to break down what's new, what matters, and what it means for the 2020 election. Search and favorite Article 2, Inside Impeachment on TuneIn. fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And it tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all advancing right now as investors digest a flurry of corporate news. Impeachment looms and trade worries retreat. The S&P up 3 to 31.95, up one-tenth of 1%. Dow up 21 points, also up one-tenth of 1%. NASDAQ up 18. That's a gain of two tenths of 1%. Tenured on 1330 seconds yield 1.92%. Gold down one tenth of 1%. 1474 the ounce. Sam West, Texas intermediate crude up two tenths of 1%. 6103 a barrel. So again, recapping here, stocks higher, little changed, on track for a record close. S&P up three, up one tenth of 1%. Balance of power continues once again. Here he is, David Weston. Thanks so much, Charlie Pellet. Live from the Interactive Broker Studio. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We don't yet have the details of the deal President Trump says he struck with China on trade, but we're told it's big, and it's the president who says so. This is a very large deal, the China deal. It covers tremendous manufacturing, farming, uh, a lot of rules, regulations. A lot of things are covered. It's a phase one deal, but a lot of big things are covered. To take us through what we know and what we don't know, we welcome now Chris Kruger. He's Cowan at Washington Research Group Analyst. So, Chris, welcome. What do we know? Uh, well, we should know a lot more than we do now in <laughs> early January. I think we, we still definitely have a lot more uh, questions than answers, though. Do we have any sense of what's taken so long? I, I'm told it's 86 pages, right, uh, more or less. And it, is it just a translation problem? It seems like a long time to get that translated. Uh, uh, There's definitely that. It's also not that uh, Ambassador Lighthizer, the United States trade rep, it's not like he hasn't had a lot on his plate either, right? You've had uh, the WTO closure. You've had Europe tariffs. You've had USMCA uh, and uh, an impeachment. So it's not like... uh, the president doesn't have a lot on his plate, uh, and it's you know it's also you also have a time difference as well, right? Uh, there are estimates about how much in agricultural products are going to get bought here, uh, and we've had Ambassador Lighthizer saying it's as much as forty, fifty billion dollars more. We have other estimates, eighty, ninety billion dollars. I've seen some analysts who have said, you know what, I don't think that's possible. I just don't think it's physically possible for China to buy that, that as many soybeans, for example. Right. Well, let's also remember that this entire uh, decoupling or confrontation, or however you want to use uh, use your uh, you know comments, this all began over Section 301 with yes. China's alleged IP theft and forced technology transfers. This wasn't about soybeans and uh, et cetera. Uh, Also, China's largely stopped or at least significantly halted their purchases over the last two years. So even if you do hit these numbers, which are, I think, more aspirational than than reality at this point, you're sort of talking about just backfilling the last two years of of losses for farmers. So, Chris, you make a really powerful point. We forget that it was Section 301, which was not that often used, at least when I was practicing law in Washington. It was an extraordinary remedy. I'm not sure Congress ever meant 301 to say the President of the United States, you can restructure our entire trade relationship with the second largest economy in the world. Well, it's it's also uh, Section 232, right, with the steel and aluminum tariffs. Congress uh, largely... That's defense-related, right? That's sure, national security, uh, although 
you know, that Canadian aluminum and Mexican steel yeah. hardly uh, uh, national security. However, uh, you know, Congress ceded a lot of these tariff powers to the president in in the '60s, largely because. There was a belief that the Congress was more parochial. The president would always have the national interest in mind and would never be protectionist. What's happened to the efforts to maybe curtail some of that authority, and not just from Democrats? We had, for example, Chuck Grassley proposed legislation things to dial back on some of this on 232 with the national security, but also 301. Uh, very little. Uh, you, you need veto-proof majorities, so you need two-thirds in the House and the Senate, um, meaning you know almost 90 House Republicans would have to uh, roll on the president's sort of signature uh, policy uh, uh, tool, which so very little chance of, of either being uh, uh, removed. Chris, you mentioned decoupling. One, one way to put it between the United States and China, I, I've heard economic cold war uh, with China. Some pretty stark uh, words being used. Where are we going with China? Is it inevitable that are we going to uh, decouple? It's going to be impossible to just totally decouple, but really dial back substantially on the economic integration between these two countries. You know, digital iron curtain, however however yeah, you want to phrase it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have the, the, three, the three primary policy levers of 301, tariffs, which we've obviously talked about, Export controls, investment restrictions. I think these are the two big tools to watch this coming year. You look at China's industrial policy, made in China 2025. The uh, the U.S. has been using the, the powerful entity list across that section of critical industries of the future. 5G, AI, quantum computing, um, et cetera. So I think you'll if, even if the tariffs are sort of, you put a, the pin back in the grenade, you're going to see... Uh, extremely focused and targeted U.S. government bipartisan uh, pushback on all of the Made in China 2025 issues. Well, bipartisan, a critical word in what you just said as a practical matter, because we see a lot of partisanship in Washington right now. We're seeing it right now, evidently, as the House votes on impeachment. But when it comes to dealing with China, uh, there's not a lot of pushback from the Democrats. In fact, you have various people on investment things really raising questions about our relations with China economically. Absolutely. Uh, just look at uh, the late November. Um, you had uh, overwhelming near-unanimous votes on Hong Kong. Same with the Uyghur uh, Act in the House dealing with some of the uh, alleged Chinese human rights abuses in, in Xinjiang. Um, and you also have with export controls, uh, Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, Tom Cotton, Republican of Arkansas, arguably the two most divergent senators coming together on export controls, pushing the administration uh, to move forward on those regulations. So let me ask you to do what probably is the impossible, uh, segment uh, these relationships between true national security concerns, particularly when it comes to tech, to IAI, various issues like that, and uh, actually allegations of uh, digital espionage going on, on the one hand, from just economy and the other. I mean, how much of our problem with China is genuinely a national security concern as opposed to, no, we think they're just passing us by? Well, so one of the ways we got to phase one was uh, Ambassador Lighthizer going back to what he tried to do almost a year ago, which was to essentially firewall national security from the goods uh, surplus, some of the IP uh, issues, forced technology transfers. But you know whether it's it's Huawei, the Belt and Road Initiative made in China 2025, uh, the buildup in the South China Sea. All of those are advancing along an extremely bipartisan path. So if you can get sort of phase one on, you know, soybeans and and some other uh, purchases. And by the way, these are all purchases that China wants to make. Um, it's really, I think, sort of the, the next fronts in this broader geopolitical narrative. Um, uh, have much broader impacts within the real economy. But it sounds almost like, if you'll forgive me, old economy, new economy. We can talk about soybeans and wheat and things like that. I would think of that as old economy. When you're talking about AI, you're talking about 5G, like a Huawei, uh, that that is much, much more difficult, it feels like right now, to come to terms with the Chinese on. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're literally dealing with the, the low-hanging soybeans, right? Like all of the hard issues um, are either not going to be resolved or are going to be litigated, not just next year, next next decade, uh, arguably, uh, for the next foreseeable future. Fascinating. Okay. What are you looking for in the new year? 
What's the one thing you're concentrating on the most? What does phase one uh, look like? What's and, really in that 86-page document? And when do we get the export, uh, export controls question of when, not if. Okay. Thank you so much. Really Thank great you. to have you with us today. That's Collins' Chris Kruger on trade. And now we're to that magical time of the day. We find out what's coming up on Bloomberg Business Week from Jason Kelly. So much magic dust uh, here <laughs> coming up on the program, David. Uh, we're going to catch up with Eric Schatzker. His interview with Stan Druckenmiller Miller earlier today, rolled out earlier today, one of the most read on the terminal. Everyone wants to know what the world's most influential investors are thinking about heading into 2020. Every single time he talks, everybody literally wants to hear what Stanley Druckenmiller thinks. Absolutely. I mean, he is one of the best known and uh, best performing investors of our time. So we're going to get into that. that. And also uh, do a little soft bank. Great. This is coming up with Bloomberg Business Week. That does it for Balance of Power. On Bloomberg Radio, I'm David Weston. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night, and somehow I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. (laughs) It was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here, testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots, or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed... When you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Far wing, elevates, triple bucket. The war of the crowd, the shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good. On Search the NBA bus. today to start listening. Of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. Welcome to Bloomberg Business Week. It is Wednesday, December 18, 2019. Carol Master, along with my co host Jason Kelly. Top story today it is the most read on the Bloomberg. It's about one of the world's most influential investors when he gives his outlook, his thoughts about the market. People tend to listen timidly. Yeah. Features prominently in Which this. Is Eric Schatzker is going to be not what he usually is, right? He's, He's usually kind of all in on something. He's usually pretty bold. All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. Let's get back, though, to your top business stories and a look at the trading day. Here is Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. Happy Wednesday. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all moving higher right now. We are looking at records with the S&P up another three points, 31.95. But U.S. stocks are struggling to hold gains as investors digest a flurry of corporate news. Impeachment looms and trade worries retreat. Q2 
Keep it locked into Bloomberg for the latest on impeachment. We've got the Dow up 28 points, a gain there of one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ up 19, a gain there of two-tenths of one percent. Ten years down 12, 30 seconds, yield 1.92 percent. Gold down a tenth of a percent at 14.74 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil up two-tenths of one percent, 61.03 a barrel. Again, recapping, S&P up three, up one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Jason Kelly, Carol Master here with you on a Wednesday afternoon. And the cover story of Bloomberg Business Week this week, it's all about SoftBank. A deep dive, I dare say, like you've never seen about what's been going on with Masasone. Yeah, exactly. You're going to get some insight into the type of person he is because some days you can get kind of the good Masayoshi son and sometimes you can get the one who gets a little bit angry. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot to be disappointed and maybe angry about, not just for him, but for some of the investors in that big vision fund. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. Also, speaking of SoftBank, we're going to check in on the world of venture capital. It has been uprooted, yeah. upended in many ways by the SoftBank effect over the last couple of years. But what's ahead for 2020? We'll put that to one of the leading VCs. We'll get into that in just a moment. And we're also going to talk after the closing bell about Micron Technology. They'll be out with their latest uh, quarterly earnings results. So we'll see how that uh, quarter goes and what the stock reacts. First up, though. First up, let's set the Business Week agenda. Joe Weisenthal is here, market editor for Bloomberg, co-host of What'd You Miss? That's coming up at 4 p.m. Wall Street time on BTV. And Dave Wilson, stocks editor, author of the chart and stock of the day. He's here with us as well. I want to start with Joe in part because... Joe Weisenthal solved a mystery today as we were taping our weekend show and gave me, at least, the metaphor that I needed to understand the repo market. I, I felt story. like the Good. scales fell from my eyes, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. I want all intros that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was really good Thank because yeah. we talk about the repo market a lot. I feel like we ask people to understand right. it or to understand why it's so important. So the thing that really, and I had the same experience, um, kind of eye-opening, uh, you know, they talk about the shortage of bank reserves as being essential at the, mm-hmm. but what are bank reserves? Right. Right. And uh, a few weeks ago on our podcast, we were talking to Zoltan Posar, who is the uh, the repo market whisperer over at Credit Suisse. Everyone listens to his words. And the analogy he said is like, they're tokens. And the reason tokens is such a powerful analogy and so useful is because you can imagine a situation in which everyone shows up at the arcade and everyone has plenty of quarters in their pocket and all the machines are working and everything's fine. But if there's a shortage of tokens and the machines don't take quarters, you could still have a crisis or you could still have a huge spike in the cost of buying what tokens there are. And it's the perfect way to conceptualize how you could have a shortage of something but it not necessarily be reflective of people uh, being broke. Yeah. Because, of course, when we think about the crisis in 2008, 2009, that was a lack of money. Right. People, people were broke. lost a lot yeah. of money. Assets were being written down. And what we've seen lately is people have a lot of treasuries and other very high-quality safe assets. But because the Fed had been shrinking its balance sheet, the supply of these tokens had diminished. And these tokens are how banks pay each other for overnight loans. And that, to me, finally like clicked is how can you have a repo crisis – That's not a systemic crisis. It's a great explanation. And as we said after we talked about you for the weekly show, (laughs) um, that I feel like anytime the repo market comes up, everybody We're just going to play the clip. Great. It's it's an arcade. It's tokens. You probably knew all this already, Dave, but it really uh, helped to enlighten me. I get it. I just wonder how much of uh, the younger crowd, you might say, is going to even realize (laughs) what the heck we're talking about when when we refer to an arcade. Is that when they take back your car? Is that what that is? Exactly. Wait, isn't that the the thing? Yeah. that plays on all the screens in Bloomberg that shows like the internal TV network. Well, it works for me and anyone of a certain age. Anyway, Indeed. Dave, what are you looking at? I tell you, it kind of seems like you know this is the week to get deals done if you're going to get them done. Certainly uh, today has that look a bit when you think about Fiat Chrysler getting together with PSA Group, the owner of Francis Peugeot. You look at what's going on in the insurance business. Uh, Cigna selling its life and disability unit to New York Life for $6.3 billion. Uh, you've got another company, Voya Financial, with a one and a quarter billion dollar sale of some sort of legacy business, older assets. Uh, 
uh, you know, policies they don't sell anymore, especially individual life insurance uh, to Resolution Life Group for, uh, you know, like I said, one and a quarter billion. And then you have this uh, defense contractor, Lidos Holdings, uh, one of the best performers in the S&P 500 today, interestingly enough. Uh, they agreed to buy a cybersecurity firm called Dynetics for $1.65 billion. So, you know, I mean, there's just some big price tags with these deals. And uh, for the most part, they've been well received, although fiat shares are, are down about a half a percent here in the U.S. So, you know, we'll have to see if we get more of this in the next couple of days as, as the year winds down. All right, Carol Master, what are you looking at? Uh, watching Tesla. Man, that stock on the move. Uh, we certainly have a couple of stories on the terminal. Our Craig Trudell putting out a story. Next stop, $420 a share. Te- Tesla stock climbing to an intraday record high. It is up about 3% right now as we speak, up more than 11 bucks at $390.31 a share. And they've surged more than 50% since the company reported a surprise profit on October 23rd. That's quite a move up. But it's so interesting. And this is a name that when we talk about, like, you bring a guest on, an investor, either somebody's all in oh, on yeah, it right. or they're all out on it. Yeah, nobody's really like, oh, Tesla's yeah, cool. Yeah, I've always said the thing with Tesla is a little bit like watching Elon do like a high wire act. Yeah. You can't look away. Will he get to the other end or will he fall split on his face? And you just, there's no way to look away. There's and no way not to Speaking of that high wire act, let's not forget that's why that $420 number becomes so important because of that nice tweet he put out. Four hundred twenty dollars share buyout funding secured yeah. back in the day. The got him in trouble with the SEC. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so what are you watching, Jason? Uh, you know, I'm looking at one of the most read. It's uh, the headline: Apollo and Blackstone are stealing Wall Street loan business. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is it's not a totally new story. It's just amped up in a lot of ways. And when you think about these private equity firms sort of playing the other side of this trade in some ways, the debt side, the leverage side, not just the equity side anymore. It's a big expansion of those names. Well, as the PE world expands into the credit side of it, right, somebody's going to lose out because that's not part of their business and kind of your traditional Wall Street firms, they're starting right. to lose out on All this. All right, I want to move to the Bloomberg Markets Bite of the Day before we let these guys Love go this. because Dave Wilson's going to have a guess. Uh, the Bloomberg Markets Bite of the Day, it's one number that tells us a lot. Today's number, it's number one, Dave. Can you guess what it is? Number one. We talked about it yesterday in the newsroom. Does that give you a hint? Think about a chart. And not one of your charts. Think about the billboard chart. Think about something you love. Music, charts. Mariah Mm -hmm. Carey. Oh, yes. There we go. Yes. 25 years after the debut of her version of All I Want for Christmas is You, the the song has finally claimed the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. I know, right? It previously reached a peak position of number three. That was back in 2018. The latest number one achievement is her 19th overall, giving her more number one singles on the Hot 100 than any other solo artist. She does trail the Beatles, though. They've got 20. But Dave, I was listening to Christmas music over the weekend. Darlene loves Baby uh, put Christmas, Baby Please Come Home. That's the better song. That's what my husband plays. Anytime I put anything else on, That's he's like, better song. He's oh, like yeah. we're going right to Darlene Love. Right? I'll even go. take you 2s cover version of that song. Did you oh, see when right. Letterman still had the show? Every yeah. Christmas he'd have Darlene Love on, and it was That's just be- I hate to say it's better than the Mark. I think, from what I remember, she's going to be on The View this year, if she hasn't been already, right. doing that song. All well, right. Tune in to that. Make Dave Wilson, Joe Weisenthal, thank you so much. Let's head down to D.C. Martin DeCaro is there with World and National Headlines. Hey, Martin. Thank you, Jason. It's a partisan atmosphere here. The House continues final debate on the two articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump. Florida Democratic Congresswoman Kathy Castor explains why she will vote to impeach the president. When the president withheld military aid to vulnerable new Ukraine and pressed for a personal favor to manufacture dirt against a political opponent, he went too far. Republicans are condemning the process and defending the president's conduct in the Ukraine pressure campaign. Campaign. Final votes expected late in the day. Polls show the public split down the middle on impeachment. The president, meanwhile, has been tweeting his anger with Democrats most of the day. Former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort, serving seven and a half years for multiple felony convictions, won't have to face state charges in New York after all. A state judge in Manhattan has 
dismissed a residential mortgage fraud case against Manafort. New York Supreme Court Justice Maxwell Wiley ruled the charges amounted to double jeopardy since Manafort's already been convicted of federal bank and tax fraud under special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance's office brought the state charges in an effort to keep Manafort in custody in case President Trump pardons him for the federal convictions. In Washington, Nathan Hager, Bloomberg Radio. States would be able to import cheaper prescription drugs from Canada for the first time under a plan the Trump administration's taking up. It's been long advocated by liberal groups but opposed by the pharmaceutical industry on safety grounds. The plan's in its initial stages and many expensive drugs would be excluded. Global News 24 hours a day on air and a quick take by Bloomberg powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Martin DeCaro. This is Bloomberg. What do you count? Interest rates? If you get marginally higher interest rates, does that bring the P.E. multiple in? Trade figures? China driving a tectonic shift in the availability of money. Employment data? What is happening with the headcount? You could just leave all that to us. Is it a one-and-done tariff adjustment? Tom Keen and Jonathan Vero, right where it counts. Bloomberg Surveillance, weekday mornings at 7 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. What if you could keep the top economic experts in a conference room next to your office without having to feed them? Do we need better optics? Do we need some substance? Do CEOs care about ESG? We have seen quite a lot of stimulus pumped into the system already. It's the biggest warning yet about the financial risks of climate change. Now, there are more ways to hear us. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com and iHeartRadio apps, and at BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo Jelly Jelly adjective Jelly is a shorter, better way to say jealous As in, Chloe, I am like so jelly of your unicorn phone case You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit AdoptUSKids.org Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Adopt U.S. Kids and the Ad Council are you interested in it? How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial free music stations. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown! It is college football bowl season on TuneIn. This Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, the bowl season kicks off from the beautiful Bahamas. Back to throw, fires, run of the slam, caught, touchdown! The Charlotte 49ers will be playing their first bowl game in school history. They'll be matched up against the Buffalo Bulls. Don't miss the first bowl game of the season. To listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown again. Search NFL today. The puck drops. 
12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. As we wave goodbye to the 2010s, Tune In is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protest against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, Greta Gerwig on bringing Louisa May Alcott's novel Little Women to the big screen. Women have all kinds of practice imagining themselves as men, and men have very little practice imagining themselves as women. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut. The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turn around, jumper from eight feet is good on Search the NBA today to start listening. And breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ holding on to gains. In fact, at records, little change right now on the S&P 500 index, up by just about one-tenth of one percent, up three points at 3195. Stocks advancing as investors digest a flurry of corporate news, impeachment looms, and trade worries retreat. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 29 points. That's a gain of one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ higher by 21, a gain there of just about three-tenths of one percent. Your tenure down 11.30 seconds. Yield now is 1.92 percent. Gold little change down 60 cents the ounce at 14.75. And West Texas Intermediate Crude also little changed up by less than one-tenth of one percent. Now at $60.98 a barrel. So recapping, yes, stocks are at records. Little change right now. Now with the S&P up three, a gain there of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thanks a lot. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week right here on Bloomberg Radio. All right, so I really, really find these stories that are on the Bloomberg um, that drill down on what trade policy, trade wars, and tariffs mean for U.S. workers on the ground really, really important. And that includes a story that today looks at what tariffs by the Trump administration have meant for one steel town in Illinois. Writing that story, it's a, a dynamic duo. Sean Donnan, senior trade reporter at Bloomberg News, he joins us in our 991 studio in Washington, D.C. And then right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio is Joe Doe. He's metals and mining reporter at Bloomberg. News. These guys went on a road trip. Sean, kick it off. Tell me where you tell us where you guys went and what you were looking at. So we went to a place uh, called Granite City, Illinois. It's uh, right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. It is uh, an emblem of what Donald Trump likes to talk about as his victories when it comes to trade policy. Uh, Granite City is home to an enormous U.S. steel plant that in one form or another has been there for more than 100 years. Uh, and it uh, had shut down in 2015. Uh, in 2018, after Donald Trump introduced steel tariffs of 25% on any imported steel, uh, the blast furnaces, there's two of them at Granite City were refired, and there's now 1,700 people or so who are back at work there. It is a success story on the face of it for Donald Trump's trade policy. And what we set out to discover, and this came out of conversations Joe and I had been having about the steel tariffs and what was happening in the steel industry, was you know what what was happening on the ground. What, mm-hmm. What's the real story? And when you scratch the surface a little bit here, you discover that almost two years after these tariffs went into place, 
the steel mill is facing a lot of the same questions that it was uh, before it shut down in 2015. The real economics of an aging steel um, plant haven't changed. Right. And that really casts a big shadow not only over the workers there, but over a whole community of people. So, Joe, come on in here. Tell us what's going on in the business that is reflected uh, in Granite City. Yeah, I mean, this is – so Sean and I had been talking about kind of what's the next steel trade story we can work on. And what we drilled down to and was I essentially said, you know, Sean, we've, we've – basically we've hit a reset button two years after the tariffs were implemented. And really what it is is U.S. steel mills versus U.S. steel mills. Mm. And we're really talking about integrated versus uh, many mills. Granite City comes back online because it gets an injection of profit. Uh, the company is able to reopen it. They're able to bring it in at lower cost. Um, but they face now the same troubles in the future that technically all the integrated mills face, which is the mini mills that are all over the United States and produce at lower cost because the power is less. They can turn them on and off quickly and not have to do all this these This is a restarts. story we've heard before, right? It is a story we've heard before. Yeah. And, and we're finally kind of bringing this all together. We've, we've had a couple years for everything to play out, right? And when you talk to the steel executives... Prices are lower than they were a year and a half ago, and they basically keep preaching the same thing. we got to be lower cost, and we got to be competitive. U.S. Steel, whenever people ask me, well, what do you think about U.S. Steel and the, and the steel trade you know, tariffs? I try to tell them U.S. Steel is a company-specific story. And I think we really get to that here in this story that Sean and I wrote, which is pointing out that the company just made a $700 million investment in a mini-mill. They are building another mini-mill down in Alabama. This is... Andrew Carnegie's company that created integrated steel mills and is now going after mini mills. It was, as I said to somebody on the phone the other day, you know, the biggest change U.S. Steel is going through since Andrew Carnegie is what they are doing right now. And Granite City is competing against those very mills feel, that they're investing in. I feel like in. it's like when energy, like the big integrated oil companies are looking at alternatives, right? To right. some extent. Um, this is what they're doing. So, Sean, does it just, is it a reminder that trade policy can just do so much? Yeah, look, I mean, the reminder here is that trade policy doesn't change the underlying economics uh, that you get. Uh, you know, the, we get a mini deal between the U.S. and China. That doesn't change uh, the underlying economic relationship. It may not shift it very much. Uh, you get a USMCA, you look at the economic impact, and it's at the margins. There are, there are bigger things going on. There are bigger forces than trade policy. And yet, at the same time, trade policy can make a mess of it all in the meantime. I mean, one of the things is, you know, when we talk about the steel tariffs, we, we talk about uh, the the benefits that you saw in a place like Granite City, which is reopened. Uh, what we often forget is that the higher prices that uh, Granite City was able to reopen on the back of are higher prices that were paid by steel consumers. And in many cases, they have many more employees than the steel mills that benefited from the higher prices. And uh, there's a lot of folks out there who look at what we see now in the U.S. economy, and that's a manufacturing recession that's been right. developing this year, and say, well, you know what? Higher steel prices, that's a big input. That's yeah. part of the reason that at some of these firms who have been paying higher higher costs, not just there, but for on tariffs for uh, inputs from China, that, that they're having problems. And all of this kind of comes back, and, and it, you know, there's a big feedback right. loop in the U.S. economy. All right. So, Joe, wrap us up here in the last 45 seconds or so. So where are we, you know, given everything that's happened with trade talks, tariffs, and whatnot? Give us the sense of the moment right now uh, in the steel industry. Companies are trying to produce uh, at more efficient levels. They're trying to get their costs down. Um, they realize that the demand in the next year is probably not going to be great. So you can't really continue opening up more production because that's going to drive prices down, which is one of the things we're seeing now. And so I think the best answer to that is... Who knows? Uh, it's not a great situation, and anybody in steel will tell you that. And also, people who are buying steel will tell us, it's great the Granite City opened back up, but at the end of the day, I'm still looking for the lowest price to yeah. ship up and down the Mississippi River, and they might not be it in a year. And you have to compete with the likes of China, right, where there's also so much Nonstop. Pressure. Yeah, exactly. Great story. Really good. I mean, just taking you right to where you need to go, literally and figuratively. And who doesn't want to take a road trip with these guys to Granite City, Illinois? I, I want to be invited blast. next time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Left us here, guys. Yeah. Really? Sean Donnan, Senior Trade Reporter. He's in D.C. Joe Doe here with us in New York City. Coming up, we're going to 
bring you one of the world's most influential investors. Stick around. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Market Minute. Stocks are inching ahead, advancing further into record territory. Investors have taken a step back as trade worries fade. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 29, the S&P 500 up 3, the Nasdaq Composite is up 22. It's a deal. The boards of Fiat Chrysler and France's PSA Peugeot have signed an agreement that will create the world's fourth largest auto manufacturer. It's the biggest auto industry tie-up since Daimler's ill-fated purchase of Chrysler in 1998. Chipotle is trying something new in the hopes of boosting burrito sales. It's testing a walk-up window at a restaurant in Chicago across from Wrigley Field. It's part of a Chipotle redesign that will arrive at a few dozen restaurants next year. Broadcom is up 2%. The Wall Street Journal reports the company is looking to sell one of its wireless chip businesses in a deal that could be worth $10 billion. It would speed Broadcom's shift away from its semiconductor roots. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. The Bloomberg Business of Sports podcast. How did the Yankees become this mega valuable team? Where the money is flowing inside sports around the globe. From the marketing perspective, where are the dollars spent? From union heads to team owners, Scott Soshnick and Michael Barr speak to the names that power this multi-billion dollar industry. Boston Red Sox CEO Sam Kennedy. National Hockey League Commissioner Gary Bettman. Bloomberg Business of Sports. Listen today on Bloomberg.com the Bloomberg Business app or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. This year, make Christmas shopping a pleasure. Come to Bista Village with over 160 beautiful boutiques set in a fairy tale Cotswolds Christmas garden, glittering by day and magically illuminated by night. After a day's hard work finding the perfect gifts, reward yourself with festive menus and cocktails at Farm Shop Restaurant and Cafe by Soho House & Co. or a delicious dinner at Cafe Wolseley. Bista Village, the perfect place for Christmas shopping. Ah, Christmas, a time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone success with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Be honest. How much attention are you really paying to this advert? 25%? Maybe 30%? If you're sitting in traffic and the kids have stopped arguing, what about 0%? Well, now's the time to give 0% attention. Because for a limited time only, the entire mini range is available with 0% APR. All you need to decide is which mini is perfect for you. Good to know we've now got 100% of your attention. Search 0% mini to find out more. Who's in? Minimum 25% deposit on 24-month select agreements for new models registered by 31st of December 2019 at participating retailers subject to availability. Excludes mini electric. UK residents age 18 plus. Guarantees may be required. Mileage and other conditions apply if you return the vehicle. T's and C's apply. Mini UK, a trading name of BMW UK Limited, is a credit broker, not a lender. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily. Hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. 
Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. What was your favorite podcast of 2019? Well, here's ours. This is the Open Ears Project, a new daily podcast in which people tell us a story about the piece of classical music that means the most to them. Part mixtape, part sonic love letter. The Open Ears Project is where people share a classical track that gives a glimpse into their lives and allows us to hear the music and each other differently. Brought to life things that I couldn't really put into work. Search Open Ears Project on TuneIn to check it out. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. So obviously everyone should listen to all of this show every day of their lives, but better you really want to tune in to this next segment because everyone in the Bloomberg is reading about what this guy has to say as we head into 2020. It's been the most read story of the day and it's just stood there. <laughs> Nothing's exactly. changed. All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. Eric Schatzker, editor at large at Bloomberg News, will join us in just a moment. In the meantime, back to your top business stories with Charlie Pellet. Hi, thank you very much. We've got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ clinging to modest gains with the S&P up to now. That's a gain of one-tenth of one percent. The Dow up 26, higher by one-tenth of one percent. And NASDAQ advancing now by 21 points. That is a gain of just about two-tenths of one percent. So investors are digesting a flurry of corporate news as they keep an eye on impeachment proceedings. Also, trade worries have retreated. The 10-year down 10, 30 seconds. The yield right now is 1.91 percent. Well, as for what's ahead for markets in 2020, Troy Gajewski is co-chief investment officer at Skybridge Capital. If you think of next year, you think of the fact that the economy is stabilizing one and a half to two percent, maybe with upside surprise. We will see earnings growth unlike this year. And again, the U.S. Uh, Fed, who's still very much involved, you could get another right tail. Not to the same degree as this year. Certainly, you know, 10, 15 percent returns for equities. I think everyone would be happy with FedEx shares trading lower. We've got FedEx declining by 10% as the parcel company lowers its profit forecast for the year. UPS shares down as well today. They're dropping by just about 2%. After the bell, Micron Technology shares up now by four tenths of 1%. Recapping stocks higher, S&P up three, a gain of one tenth of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Jason Kelly. All right, so we have mentioned this most read story on the Bloomberg. It's about Stanley Druckenmiller, well known to much of our audience. And if you don't know who he is, you should, because he's one of the world's most influential investors. Well, he caught up with our own Eric Schatzker. Recently, that story rolled out across all the Bloomberg platforms today. Eric's with us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker studio. So what did Stan the man have to tell you? Jason, Stanley Druckenmiller, for those who don't know was the greatest hedge fund manager of his generation. He hung up the high tops in 2010. He turned into a, converted if you like, his hedge fund into a family office. This guy was so fearless, he took on the Bank of England, shorting the pound in 1992, making a billion dollars for George Soros, whom he was chief investment officer for at the time. Gives you a sense of the kind of aggressive, huge bets that Druckenmiller put on in the course of his career now, he describes himself as timid, a coward even. Why? Here's one snippet of the interview to give you an idea. This administration, with wondering about where the hell the next bomb is coming from, just doesn't allow me to take some of the positions I've taken historically where I just thought it was a one-way bet. To me, this was always binary and a two-way bet. 
So the combination of the Trump presidency, a decade of monetary experimentation by central banks, and more and more competition from investors whom he never had to face at the height of his career, and I'm talking about quants, have sapped his courage. And he's very matter-of-fact about it. It's a very stark reminder of how much has changed in finance yeah. and why so many of the once all-powerful macro-managers, the masters of the universe, Paul Tudor Jones, for example, Louis Bacon, have been struggling in the post-crisis environment. It's a reminder that things are indeed different this time around in terms of the financial markets. Things have changed dramatically over the last decade. Last it's harder years. for these people, they're mostly men, to make money. Um, the things, Stan talks about the fact that the signals, the price signals that he used to use to make decisions about what to buy, what to sell, what to go long, what to short, don't work anymore. He blames it largely on quants, and that's not an excuse. He says, look, the markets have changed structurally, and I'm a dinosaur. I need to adapt if I want to survive. Now, let's be clear. He's not having a terrible year. He's in double digits. He bet on Brexit effectively. He bought the pound. He bought British banks going into the U.K. election. And so Boris Johnson's victory was a victory for him and sent him over 10%. But this is... 10 and something, let's call it, double digits, barely, in a year when the U.S. stock market is up 27%, worldwide stocks are up 24%, high yield on a total return basis is up 17 investment grade is up 13 It just, on a comparative basis, it's just not that great. Yeah. So, Eric, as you say, and, and as you've illustrated both in your description, and we heard it a little bit in the tone in that snippet that you played, tell us about how you read Stan. You know him, you followed him for a long time. Like, what was your read as, as someone who's so smart about this market? He wishes he could be doing better, yeah. for sure. He's still a competitive person, but he's not driven to take the kind of bets he once did, in part because he's no longer managing money for clients. Mm -hmm. He says, if I were, I probably would own more Mexican peso. I probably would own more Kiwi dollar, a couple of the other positions he has, in addition to the Aussie dollar, the Canadian dollar, Japanese equities, stuff that's going to do well in a healthy to good global economy. He, he sort of, like I say, he's kind of at peace with yeah. it. It's... Um, now, you can say, sure, it's easy to be at peace with that situation, Stan. You're a multi-billionaire. You have a great track record. You got out of the business at the right time, right. saying you didn't believe that you could make the returns for investors that you once did, and sure enough, he hasn't been able to. So th that's all well and good, but if, if you are still trying to make money for your clients, like a Paul Tudor Jones, for example, um, good luck. Well, because he really was among the first to sort of make that call in many ways, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And he's been followed by countless right. others, right? David Tepper, for example, mm -hmm. Richard Perry, Eric Mindich. I mean, the list goes on and on. John Paulson of these once all-powerful masters of the universe who have decided that either because they've grown wealthy enough or because they just don't have it, have the mojo anymore, they either need to give money back to clients, some or all of it, and convert to a family office. It's just, I love some of the reporting you've done. I think about um, the conversation you had with the PGM CEO, right? This whole idea of a zombie David Hunt, future, yes. right? Like it's all, this is where it's, it's all. It's part all part and parcel yeah. of the same transformation that's taking place in financial markets. Now, to give Stan some credit, he still makes some awfully good calls. Last year at this time, he was long treasuries because he felt as though the Fed was overstepping and was going to have to cut back. And sure enough, starting in July, it did. Now right. he's short treasuries thinking that they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have to cut. It's uh, excuse stuff. me, they're going to have to raise now yeah, that they've yeah. cut three times in a row. Exactly. Well, it's terrific and no surprise, one of the most read stories. Great week for Eric Schatzker it's to say the least. not one of the most read. It is the, the most, most read. read. Sorry, nice superlative. Matt Winkler is somewhere is like, yeah. yes, let's be, be more specific. <laughs> specific. Yes. Specific. Eric Schatzker, Kelly. as always, thank you. thank you so much. All right, let's get down to Washington. Martin DeCaro is there with World National Headlines. Hey, Martin. 
Hello, Jason. The House has embarked on six hours of debate on two articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Irv Chapman joins us live from Capitol Hill. Irv, are lawmakers covering any new ground before the expected vote later on? Martin, after weeks of hearings, transcripts, the Mueller report, press conferences and broadcasts, that would be very hard to do. To make the case against President Trump, Speaker Nancy Pelosi charged that he used the power of his public office to obtain an improper political benefit. It is a matter of fact that the president is an ongoing threat to our national security and the integrity of our elections, the basis of our democracy. It is tragic that the president's reckless actions make impeachment necessary. He gave us no choice. Republicans charged that the president did not pressure the president of Ukraine to help him with, win re-election, and Democrats aimed an impeachment from the very first day of his administration, they said. Martin? Thanks, sir. Outside the Capitol, as House members arrived this morning... Today, the House will vote to impeach the president. Well, as Will Goodman, member of a liberal veterans group, Vote Vets, polls show the public is divided on impeachment, and Trump's approval rating hit 45% in a Gallup poll. That's the highest since April. The administration is trying to bar immigrants convicted of certain crimes from a, uh, claiming asylum in addition to existing restrictions. The proposal lists seven criminal categories, including convictions for illegally re-entering the U.S. and drunk driving. It has to go through a public comment period first. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and a quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Martin DeCaro. Why is delivering the best client experience a top priority at BNY Mellon's Pershing? Michelle Feinstein, Director of Client Engagement, explains. Today's investors want a financial relationship that's on demand, customized, and leverages the latest digital technology. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, helping advisory firms and broker dealers create great experiences for their clients is our priority. Through our integrated wealth experience, we give you a high touch service, flexible technology choices, and expert insights so you can deliver a highly personalized experience to your clients at every step from onboarding to wealth planning to performance analysis and more and because we're part of bny mellon you'll benefit from more than 230 years of strength and stability at pershing we're personally invested in your success visit pershing.com to learn more about pershing's integrated wealth experience pershing llc and pershing advisor solutions llc are both members of finra and sipic Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at babble.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I'll give you 20p for it. 50p? Five pounds. Isn't it great when you get more for something than you expected? Scrap or part exchange with Vauxhall and we'll give you a guaranteed £4,000 towards a new Crossland X or Grandland X with 4.9% APR representative. Search Vauxhall Trade It. T's and C's and restrictions apply. Trading car must be registered in your name for at least 90 days. Available on conditional sale and personal contract purchase only. Subject to status 18 plus Vauxhall Finance. Other deposit contributions may be available if you don't have a trade-in vehicle. As we wave goodbye to the 2010s, TuneIn is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, 
the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protests against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams, starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Back to throw, fires, run of the slant, caught, touchdown! He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! This Saturday, at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the lights shine bright on the Las Vegas Bowl. Washington Huskies head coach Chris Peterson will coach his final game before retiring as he takes on his former school, the Boise State Broncos. Down to the five, he leaps for the end zone, and he is in! <laughs> to listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. From ESPN and the award-winning producers of The Sterling Affairs comes the latest season of 30 for 30 podcasts. Four brand new stories of espionage. He wanted this team to be the Barcelona of women's basketball. Resilience. I started to scream. I tried to get away. Corruption. It's the culture of win at all costs. And rebirth. How will we ever rebuild it? 30 for 30 podcasts, season six. Listen and favorite 30 for 30 podcasts on TuneIn. Ho, ho, ho! Make my job easier this year with a subscription to TuneIn Premium. Featuring the world's largest selection of music, news, podcasts, and sports. It's a gift they'll enjoy every day, all year long. Ho, ho, ho! Happy Holidays! Search Premium to upgrade today. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ are all advancing right now. Stocks clinging to modest gains amid the impeachment showdown. We've got the S&P up three at 31.96, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. The Dow up 22 points, higher by one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ up as well, higher by 20. 24 points. That's a gain of three tenths of one percent. Ten years down, 11.30 seconds. Yield right now, 1.91 percent. Gold on the minus side, lower little change, down 78 cents the ounce at 14.75. Crude West Texas Intermediate higher, also little changed up two cents a barrel, 60.96 on WTI. Brent 66.19. That's a gain of one tenth of one percent. Recapping stocks inching higher. Trading at records with the S&P up three, up one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thanks a lot. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week right here on Bloomberg Radio. So I saw a report earlier, I think it was Reuters, they talked about unicorns like Uber, Lyft, and Slack. Disappointing in terms of the IPO market this year, but even so, U.S. venture capital firms giving birth to a record number of unicorns in 2019. So let's get some thoughts on the world of venture capital, what's in store for 2020. Lonnie Jaffe is back with us, Managing Director for Insight Venture Partners here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Welcome back. Happy almost new year. Thank you. Great to be here. <laughs> so what, I mean, God, if you went back a year from now, nobody probably would have predicted 2020 or 2019, excuse me, in terms of we work. Like everybody was looking forward to these big unicorns finally coming public. Didn't actually play out, I think, like we thought. So I don't know. What does that mean maybe potentially for 2020? So it's interesting. The, the number of IPOs was down a little bit in 2019 versus the prior year, but the amount of capital raised was actually up. And the software companies did pretty well. So the the uh, the companies like WeWork that 
were very high growth, but where people had concern over corporate governance or viewed them as being potentially challenged from a unit economics perspective, and maybe they were an investor-enabled services, right? Like the customers weren't paying for the product, the investors were paying for the product. Um, those were the ones that struggled the most. And I think you'll see some similarities going to next year, where the companies that will um, that are more likely to try to come out, and the ones that will do the best will be the ones with really high gross margins, high degrees of recurring revenue, um, you know, really strong sources of economic power like uh, network effects, and, you know, multi-sided marketplaces, platform effects, machine learning, things like that. And so you mentioned we work the W word. Um, what's the lesson? What's the single lesson that you take going into 2020 that you feel like the market will learn? I think 2020 will be the year of governance and privacy and uh, and diligence. So, um, you know, within our portfolio, we've been investing pretty heavily over many years in cybersecurity companies. This year, we've started to invest also in in privacy technology. For example, we invested in a company called OneTrust, which is one of the leaders in privacy software. Um, related to that is a, a focus on governance and uh, and safety. I mean, you see this even with a company like Airbnb, which right. which may either IPO next year or do a direct listing, um, where there's concern not just not not around things like corporate governance, but on safety of of the people who are the hosts or people who are the guests. And I think that's going to be a really important focus. Yeah, I think about that. Is it the California regulation that goes into effect January one in terms of data privacy? I mean, this is a big deal. So I wonder at Inside Partners, are you guys looking at this? And this is an uh, you know. A, an area for investment opportunity. Yeah, there's two dimensions to it. One is we're making sure that all of our existing portfolio companies have it front and center as one of their top priorities to be responsible stewards of data, especially the companies that leverage data to make their product better. And then second, it's a huge market opportunity because yeah. uh, you know, cybersecurity has gotten to the point where you can actually buy pretty good technology from vendors if you don't know how to do it yourself, if you're not Google or Facebook and you don't have really good internal security talent. For privacy, it's still the Wild West. And you know most companies are struggling to even really understand what they've collected, let alone secure it and make sure that it's being treated carefully. So when we think about this year, one of the big themes, we've been talking a lot about this, sort of what are the big themes of 2019, it's this private versus public vis-a-vis -vis valuations, vis-a-vis -vis growth, vis-a-vis -vis transparency, diligence, governance, all of those things that you just mentioned as well. Where do we go in, in 2020 in that private-public tension, as it were? Yeah, I mean, the the companies that will go public, I mean, the reasons to go public are you get increased transparency and uh, some additional liquidity, and you also see um, companies using their public liquidity to do acquisitions. Um, there's also lots of reasons to stay private. You have more flexibility with experimenting with your business model. Um, the kind of stuff that you um, you get from being an Insight Partners portfolio company, right? We have 70 full-time people at Insight who help with marketing, sales, product mon management, technology architecture. Um, it's very hard to get that from a public market investor. You know, to the extent that public market investors are active at all, they tend to be focused on return of profits and not on responsible growth. Um, and so, so I think people will, and, and there's a huge amount, in, in software, there's a huge amount of capital available to stay private if you want to. So, so companies are only choosing to go public if it's useful for them. And going public direct versus a uh, more traditional IPO, how does that shift or change in 2020? Yeah, and the, the, um, the main ingredient, I think, in that decision is whether the company needs to raise capital. Right. And, um, there, but there are some other nuances, like the lockup period, if you decide to do a direct listing, can be shorter. Um, you have less, con less control over who your initial investors are going to be. Um, you have, uh, sometimes, you know, you can avoid situations like hedge funds shorting your stock going into a lockup period, um, but you don't necessarily have control over the pricing. You can't decide, I'm not going to, I don't like the price that it's ending up at, and so I'm going to actually withdraw and stay private for a little longer. So I think the companies that will are most likely to do a direct listing if they do it are the ones like Airbnb that don't need capital. Mm -hmm. Brian Chesky said that he has more capital on hand than uh, than he did than he's raised so far as a company. Right. And that are household names because you need you really need to be able to have an investor base ready to go. Lonnie, what's what do you think the future of Twitter? Right, you guys were involved in this company in terms of investing in it, um, and it's obviously a public company. And I think, you know, I feel like we in the media love it. It's up about ten percent so far this year, but I just feel like there's kind of a love hate. I don't know if love. <laughs> we <laughs> well, use it. <laughs> I, no, I like it a lot because yeah. I feel like when there's, especially when there's a story happening, it hits Twitter so fast, and then 
you know, respected voices typically will weigh in on it. I really find it very useful. I do love it. Um, but I do wonder, what do you think the future is? Because I feel like they struggle in terms of really making a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, I would say for the, the social media product companies in general, they have a level of, uh, of economic power that's um, pretty hard to find in other categories of company, right? So they're multi-sided marketplaces. They have demand-side economies of scale where their product improves as more people use them. Um, they, but they're getting a lot more attention from from regular, regulators and politicians mm-hmm. and and the, and the media. And so I think that is going to put them in increasingly in a place where they need to uh, focus on adding value to their users. Well, if Twitter came to you, if there was entrepreneurs and the, the folks that started up came to you today and, and put this out and said, "Hey, would you invest in me? Would you?" We do take companies private at times, and the, the kinds of companies that are best suited to that are the ones where um, where they um, in, they're in the public markets and they have um, they have a hunger for the kind of guidance and support that we can provide. Mm-hmm. So if they need help with acquisitions or scaling out internationally and, and those kinds of companies. All right, last question. We got about thirty seconds left. But what's the one big idea that you think will catch on in twenty twenty as you sort of do your around the corner looking, broadly defined? Yeah, we're we're actually making major investments in software that helps people produce more software hmm. more quickly. Um, and so our, our thesis there is that software is becoming an increasingly large part of pretty much every technology company. Yeah. And you see companies like Netflix are able to release software 7,000 times a day. And most grown-up companies are not able to do that. And so we've been making a, a, like company, uh, companies like Armory, which we invested in recently, that have a product called Spinnaker, which allows you to release lots of software to mm-hmm. small por- parts of the world. And if it works, you can release it everywhere else. That, that's going to be a big focus. I Interesting. And I feel like blockchain or Bitcoin, it didn't even come up. Right, and I think like a year yeah, or so ago. That's true. No. Uh, really great uh, insights, uh, pun intended. Thank you so much, <laughs> Lonnie Jaffe, Managing Director at Insight Partners, here with us in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the bond market, the world of economics as well. As we plow through this week, I was about to say it's Thursday or Friday. It's Wednesday, folks. Stick with us. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. Somehow, I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. (laughs) It was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here. Testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder, so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. Ho, ho, ho. Who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung. Samsung within 30 days, T's and C's apply. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3, it's up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. 
From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Financial capital of the world. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We move into the final hour of trading, and we have got the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ clinging to modest gains as investors digest a flurry of corporate news. Impeachment loomed, and trade worries retreated. Treasury slipped the British pound weekend. Right now, we've got the 10-year down 12, 30 seconds with that yield 1.92%. Equities, though, holding on to their gains higher across the board. In fact, on track for a record close. S&P 500 index up now by 3 Three points. We've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 28. That is a gain of one tenth of one percent. The S&P, by the way, also higher by one tenth of one percent. Nasdaq up 24. That's a gain of three tenths of one percent. As for markets and the Federal Reserve, Jared Woodard is global investment strategist at Bank of America. It's very popular right now to talk about central banks becoming, you know, really impotent, really ineffective. That's certainly true in Europe and Japan. But look at what the Fed's done. They've engineered, you know, a huge housing rebound that's continued. Look at data this week. You're starting to see it come through in the consumer. You're starting to see low-end uh, employment really surge. And I think that's a really bullish scenario. And this headline from the Bloomberg Professional Service, a major sticking point in talks between California Governor Gavin Newsom and PG&E, said to be a takeover clause. Right now, PG&E shares, they are moving higher. PG&E up by just about 4.5%. Among the companies reporting earnings after the closing bell today will be Micron Technology. Shares up by three-tenths of 1%. Micron heading into earnings amid swelling optimism on Wall Street for the memory chip maker. We'll have those numbers, of course, as they break after the close of trading. High Ridge Brands, the owner of faded consumer names like Zest Soap and V05 Shampoo, filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy today in Delaware with plans to sell itself in a court supervised process. FedEx shares moving lower after last night's earnings report. FedEx shares lower now by 9.9%. Gold, little changed. We've got West Texas Intermediate Crude also little changed down just about one cent. Recapping, stocks moving higher, holding on to gains. S&P 500 index up three, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. Zest Soap. I, no five shampoo. I, I cannot describe for our listeners out there the <laughs> the despair that just rippled through this studio when Charlie read the headline about VO5. I have to say, though, I don't even think I've used it since maybe I was a kid. Yeah, between you and it. Kathleen Hayes, our global economics and policy yeah, editor Raina, for you Bloomberg. Did you make a sound? You didn't even know. Yeah. No, she was, I, I'm she a was, here, she so was un- she was unmoved by that. It's just like there were like she and I were commercials. Totally. Zest, I'm trying to remember what they was were. A great commercial. Oh God, yes. Zestfully clean. Yeah. Oh, see, Jason Kelly. Wow. Oh, well done. Good. Advertising guy. Yeah, that exactly. guy on his uh, uh, side. Kathleen Hayes, the aforementioned, is here. Yelena Shalecheva, senior U.S. economist for Bloomberg Economics, also here. So, Kathleen. What's moving you today when it comes to the bond market? What are you seeing? Well, you know, it's interesting because it's uh, there's a bit of a sell-off going on today. You've got the 10-year note, Charlie just mentioning, up to about one of the highest yields we've seen, 1.92%, a loss of 11.30 seconds, a 30-year bond losing nearly a full point at two point, almost 2.35%. And this is interesting, isn't it? Because we have two more Fed officials sounding very content with keeping the key rate where it that, is. Yeah. And in fact, you know, Charlie Evans, president of the Chicago Fed, saying, uh, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't mind if the inflation rate got up to two and a half percent and for a while uh john williams new york fed saying that he thinks the economy is a good place but really stressing the global risk what our basically i would say what our bloomberg bond team broadly is reporting is that you know the curve has steepened a bit people are kind of shifting the trades they're carrying right now lightening up there's you know people who are kind of still maybe bullish along trimming back a bit i think people are waiting to quote unquote see happens 
what see see what happens next. But for now, they know what's going to happen next. You know, the Fed does not seem worried or inclined in any way to move to ease anymore. It's not necessarily they're going to tighten. It's just uh, I can understand why people feel they have to adjust a bit. Yelena Shaletiva. Well, I think uh, Kathleen really uh, said it uh, very nicely. I mean, it's really, uh, the Fed is uh, very much on hold. They, that's the intention going into the next year. Uh, that will probably not be one of the highlights next year. We, uh, we will still be talking about uh, the Fed, of course. But look at how many interesting developments we are going to get in 2020. So the Fed will conclude their review of inflation target. So uh, what uh, Charles Evans' comment about to 2.5%, and the symmetric inflation goal is interesting, although he's been talking about it for a while. But we will find out whether they are moving to an average inflation targeting or not. So the conclusions will be published uh, sometime in the first half of the year. Then we will hear like um, about what they are going to do with the dot plot, because they are working on some improvements to, to that. So that will be interesting to see. But we will be talking about the Fed, but not necessarily in a sense of uh, like po- or, uh, policy or yeah uh, in- what are they going to do the dot plot so we don't know and uh, what we, needs to be better with it well Kathleen, maybe you can just well actually you know i asked i did ask rob question. kaplan president dallas fed a very specific question about this yesterday right. um he i think he, he's part of the committee that's looking at what to do with the dots and i think it is part of the broader review so i asked him how about a specific change like this to make it more transparent not necessarily put the name of each fomc member next to their dot but how about two Two colors of dots, like green dots from the FOMC voters and red dots from the non-voters to give us a better sense of what the tilt is. And he kind of looked at me and he said, well, we're going to look at a lot of things. So um, I, I suspect that might not be something they're eager to pick up. Um, but I think that would be, some, I think that's something that a lot of people would like to see. Either, In fact, some people like forget the dots. And Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed President, said, I don't want the dots. And a lot of people agree. You just get people thinking you are pledging to do something with rates and all you're saying is, well, today I think this was where rates could be. But is it helpful a little bit? Well, but other people say, yeah, because then you have a sense of where the Fed's going, but maybe putting people's names by them would give us more of an idea. But the point is they can change it, right? They they can change it. There will uh, will be interesting developments uh, on that front. And, And it's about it's all about transparency that's why this was introduced in the first place right so but the bottom line we will hear about different uh, things in terms of communication in terms in terms of developments maybe we will hear more in terms of the repo facility they will do that or right. not or we will just uh, learn a lot of things about the fed that might not be directly right. policy related and kathleen do you feel like there will be a different tone of communication in 2020 given that it is an election year and given how, at least around the Fed, how hyper-political it's become, will they be more conscious? Well, you know, I think they're always, I think right now they have to be kind of extra conscious with Donald Trump in the White House bashing the Fed all the time. But I did ask uh, Rob Kaplan that question. Uh, You know, well, if you had to tilt towards higher rates, what would you think? Would you think that was ill-advised? Could you do that in election year? And he kind of smiled and said, well, it won't affect how I conduct policies. You know, if we need to do something, we need to do something. I think a very interesting for the debate, though, for the Fed, we're already starting to see it form. Because I asked Rob specifically about, hey, how come the dots are pointing to rate hikes in 2021-22 when the, when the inflation rate is not even above really target yet? Well, you know, he's he's not. He kind of. I don't think he's totally on board with average price level it's like targeting. An SNL skit, you <laughs> Kathleen asked the question. <laughs> but uh, seriously, the Fed official, and they're like, Whoa. but I think this is this is it's going to be subtle, yeah. and it may yeah. not move the markets. But don't you think that that's what's shaping well, up, Yelena? This, this question uh, actually came up at the press conference uh, after the FOMC meeting, and uh, the answer from uh, Jay Powell was like, okay, actually, some people penciled in a high inflation for next year. Well, that's that's not uh, what we're expecting. We do think inflation will pick up, but uh, not as much as to require any policy. We're just, Leanna, Elena and I are just hoping we don't have to look for new jobs. The Fed has to <laughs> remain somewhat interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. 
It's been pretty interesting. You know, what are we going to do? You <laughs> might get that. Right. It'll be interesting. I have no doubt about it. 2020 is going to be an interesting year. All right. We're grateful for both of you. Thank you so much. Kathleen Hayes, Global Economics and Policy Editor for Bloomberg. Yelena Shalechevis, Senior U.S. Economist for Bloomberg economics. Coming up, we're going to get to the cover story of the magazine this week. It is a must-read. Sarah McBride wrote it. It's about someone, speaking of venture capital earlier, someone who is uh, well-known in the VC world. We're talking about Masayoshi-san of SoftBank and the Vision Fund. So we'll get to that in just a moment. First, let's get down to Washington. Martin DeCaro's got your world and national headlines. Hey, Martin. Hello, Jason. As the House enters the final hours of debate before voting to impeach President Donald Trump, it appears Republicans will suffer no defections with every GOP member backing the president. Bloomberg's Irv Chapman reports live from Capitol Hill. Martin, as he has during committee hearings, ranking Republican Doug Collins insisted there are no grounds for impeachment. They said we can't beat him if we don't impeach him. We on the Republican side have no problem taking our case to the people of this country because they elected Donald Trump. And it is a matter for the voters, not this house, not in this way, not in the way this is being done. Democrats, of course, asserted that the president suspending military aid to Ukraine to promote an investigation into the Bidens and standing in the way of Congress looking into it are impeachable offenses. Mark. Thank you, Irv. President Trump scheduled to address supporters at a campaign rally in Michigan tonight while the House might be voting. Americans would be able to buy cheaper prescription drugs imported from Canada under a Trump administration plan announced today by Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar. This would potentially allow for the sale of these drugs at lower list prices than currently offered to American consumers. A second draft plan would let pharmaceutical companies seek approval to import their own drugs from any country. French President Emmanuel Macron may be willing to make some concessions to labor unions who are outraged by a plan to raise the retirement age. He's asked his ministers to open negotiations with the unions and employer groups on potential changes to a pension reform package. Global News 24 hours a day on air and a quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Martin DeCaro. Europe was born about 200 million years ago when the supercontinent Pangaea began breaking apart. And today... Germany already is in a much weaker position. There's a lot of problems building up there for your country. Change happens faster now. How are you reading Euro stocks at the moment? Keep up. The CEO speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Weekdays at 1 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg. The world is listening. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. What if you could keep the top economic experts in a conference room next to your office without having to feed them? Do we need better optics? Do we need some substance? Do CEOs care about ESG? We have seen quite a lot of stimulus pumped into the system already. It's the biggest warning yet about the financial risks of climate change. Now, there are more ways to hear us. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com and iHeartRadio apps, and at BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. You know your body, and you know when something's off, when something doesn't feel quite right. Don't ignore symptoms like fatigue, joint pain, rashes, and fever. They could be signs of lupus. Listen to your body. Take care of yourself. We're here to help you take control of your health. Learn how at BeFierceTakeControl.org. Brought to you by the Lupus Foundation of America and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. 
Get out of this Christmas with full of fun and games with a whopping 20% off toys in store and online. Never mind the big day itself, that's the entertainment sorted for the whole of Christmas. Asta, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores and lines subject to availability excludes baby toys. Offer ends 19th of December. Minimum spend carry bag and delivery charges may apply. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. The game... Search NFL today. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Along the goal line, Gordon scores! He takes it home! Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. The can- Search NFL today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good. On Search the right NBA plus. today to start listening. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. <laughs> but we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop-and-go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all moving higher. In fact, we have got the S&P trading at records. Let's get more as we head right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here he is, Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, Charlie. Modest gains for the main U.S. averages right now. The Dow currently up 20 points. SB's gain three, while NASDAQ also climbs by 20. The U.S. 10 year yield at 1.92%. Gold is a little change. Small caps gain four points. And seven of the main 11 SB sectors are also trading higher, led by gains in real estate and telecom. Industrials and the financials led to the downside. NASA Bitex fall 13 points. Transports declined 88 on the FedEx news. Semis are a little change, and the VIX is higher by 1%. Leaders to the upside in the Dow, Boeing, UNH, and Nike, while Travelers and Walmart were the Dow's worst performers. After earnings, FedEx plunged 10, 10%, and in others, Tesla rose 4.2% to a record. Broadcom is seeking a buyer for its RF wireless chip unit, and Vordato declared a special dividend of $1.95 a share. Wrapping things up, Micron reports after the bell. 
live from the first to break at Newsdesk. I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie. All right, we thank you very much, Bill, and here live breaking news over your Bloomberg type squawk, S Q U A W K on your terminal. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thanks a lot. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. <laughs> magazine this week. It's about SoftBank, the Vision Fund, and the Japanese billionaire behind it all, Masayoshi San. This story peels back the layers of it all. Sarah McBride wrote it. She's venture capital reporter at Bloomberg News. She is in our 960 studio in San Francisco. Right next to me in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker studio is Joel Weber, Bloomberg Business Week editor. This story, by the way, among the most read on the Bloomberg uh, today. Um, I got to say, Joel, I love this story, and we want to bring in Sarah in a moment, but I feel like we have talked so much about the Vision Fund, about SoftBank, and MASA this year, and rightfully so. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's one of the stories of the year, and um, and the magazine, you know, like our, I think our coverage really made a mark back when we talked about WeWork, mm-hmm. and this was still when it was going to be IPOing, um, and it quickly sort of went off the rails, and we know it's transpired since then, but I think one of the bigger stories, and obviously why we made it this week's cover uh, is about SoftBank, right? That's where the money came from. Um, And when you have a $100 billion fund, it starts to sort of distort reality. So, Sarah, what did you guys find as you reported? Oh, so much great stuff. And by the way, it was a huge team effort with reporters across the globe on this, not just me. But um, we learned some interesting things about Uh, For example, a couple of the partners there, including the very colorful guy and very smart and talented guy who leads the Vision Fund, Rashiv Misra, one of his deputies, Jeff Hausenbold, is very controversial. Even the CFO has a department that a lot of people have said is very difficult to work in, including one employee who was told, oh, go back to Utah and get some more wives. And because he was Mormon, he was very insulted and left the Vision Fund. So, yeah, the, there's been sort of a, a cultural, cult, there's a culture side to this story that is uh, worth reading because it's there's a lot of different examples. And it, it really uh, goes to show the that even people on the inside say, like, there's some bad stuff that goes on here. Yeah. And sometimes it borders, borderlines on, on being reckless with their investments. Jason, what stood out to you? You know, I was really taken by some of the inside stories, and, and you guys have been alluding to it, but also this notion that we work, which you were mentioning earlier, Joel and Sarah, come on in here, really was this kind of inflection point that we've seen as bold and as audacious as Masa has been. Well, and actually, to be fair, you know, the the Vision uh, Bank portfolio, you know, the Vision Fund portfolio, it, you know, WeWork stands out. It's not the only thing that yeah. hasn't gone well, but there are other examples of their uh, investments working out. Yeah, right. Sarah, what, what stood out to you on that front? Well, um, the Vision Fund is known for its WeWork investment, but the Vision Fund's $100 billion. They committed about $4.4 billion to WeWork. So it's just a small percentage of their overall portfolio. They've got some very promising companies in there, especially in Asia. They've got one in South Korea called Kupang that's kind of a little bit like Amazon that's just growing like a weed. They've got a company called Tokopedia in Indonesia, a bunch of very promising ones. But the ones you hear about first are the blow-ups, and those often come early in the life of any fund. But what's interesting, too, and there is so much in this story, and you're right, it was a team effort, and I highly recommend that folks check it out in the magazine and online. But what was interesting, too, is, Sarah, you guys wrote about what set SoftBank and the Vision Fund apart, and that is, you know, you know, Masayoshi-san, that when he made an investment, it was go big or go, go home, big. right? And so right. really pushed the startup entrepreneurs to really expand aggressively, and he profited from that because valuations grew as a result. That's right. So he would push people, and to his credit, to think of whole new business lines they hadn't thought of, or really, you think you can only be a $50 million company? I think you can be a $500 million company. He would just kind of encourage these startup founders to really think creatively about what they could do. 
And so um, that uh, sometimes worked out for them. And then other times when valuations got pushed up so high, then that was reflected perfectly legally on their accounting. And then sometimes the marked up valuations had to be marked back down again, even though they were never marked up as fully as um, in other places. Like WeWork was never marked up to $47 billion on their balance sheet, but it still got marked up, which right. created problems. All right, so Sarah, what does 2020 bring for SoftBank based on your well, reporting? I think it can only be up from here. I um, hope some of their successes are kind of brought more to the fore for them next year, not WeWork. I, and to me, I just think, it, you know, this is... Um, the the bigger story here is you you come into VC like with this much money and it's going to test the system a mm-hmm. little bit yeah. right and everything's going to have to like react to it because it's so big and it's only been around for three years. I mean, I know. keep in mind here, and this is a big part of the story too, Vision Fund 2 is what they're also out right, pitching, right. right? Which could be even bigger than Vision Fund 1. So all of this, we, we get to see how it all plays out, and I'm sure it'll be interesting to cover. And Absolutely. a lot of the money from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So yeah. it's another and interesting element of it. To say the least, this is an outsized story in terms of its impact and the depth of the reporting. Congratulations to Sarah McBride and the team. She joined us from San Francisco, Joel Weber here with us in New York City. Stay tuned in. This is Bloomberg Business Week. This is a Bloomberg Market Minute. Stocks remain narrowly higher in the final hour, with the major averages still on track to finish at another round of all-time highs. A lack of economic headlines has given investors a chance to step back as trade concerns fade. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 32, the S&P 500 up 3, the Nasdaq Composite is up 21. Tesla is up about 4%, touching an intraday record above $393 a share. The stock is up more than 50% since Tesla posted a surprise profit in October. Instagram is laying down some rules covering content and influencer advertising. They'll no longer be allowed to promote products related to vaping, tobacco, or weapons. Micron Technology opens its books after the bell amid swelling optimism on Wall Street for the memory chip maker. At least two analysts upgraded the stock this week, and others raised their price targets, forecasting a rebound for long slumping prices. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. Right now, Doctors Without Borders medical teams are operating in some of the most remote and dangerous corners of the world. When front yards become front lines, at the crossroads of conflict and epidemic, where there are no hospitals, that's where we operate. Your response is critical to our response in places where a few others will go. That's where we operate. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org. The market's in focus every business day. The P&L Podcast with Paul Sweeney and Lisa Abramowitz. Are there some sectors that you want to have more or less exposure to? What's behind this engine of gains? Analysis of the day's Wall Street action. The U.S. market looks relatively safe. From Bloomberg Intelligence, Bloomberg Opinion, and influential newsmakers. Ward McCarthy joins us right now. P&L with Paul Sweeney and Lisa Abramowitz. Listen today on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. What? With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. In the stock market and in life, everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you. Listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary. At the office, at home, or on the go. 
Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. Slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Four of the league's top teams are in action as the Lakers take on the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, followed by the Rockets taking on the Clippers at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. 11 to 2. This Thursday, the Lakers are at the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, and the Rockets are at the Clippers 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams, starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Do you have a favorite true crime podcast this year? Here's a few of ours. On the latest season of Uncover, journalist Michelle Shepard investigates the unsolved case of a missing Toronto teen that has haunted her for 20 Toronto years. Toronto police are continuing a desperate search for a missing... And on Haunting Warhead, host Damon Fairless exposes the darkest, most shocking corners of the internet and the criminals who lurk in the shadows. How do you take down a criminal network hidden in the shadows? Search True Crime on TuneIn to discover these and more life thrillers. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York, Bloomberg 1130, to Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991, to Boston, Bloomberg 1061, to San Francisco, Bloomberg 960, to the country, Sirius XM Channel 119, and around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Well, coming up, we are going to dig into the Sackler family a little bit. Uh, obviously, at the center of the opioid business and the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, where that money went is a big issue. The founding family behind Purdue Pharma. That's coming up next. In the meantime, let's get a check on your top business story. See where the trading day holds just 29 minutes ago. Indeed, uh, 29 ago minutes, and we have got the Dow. As we speak, Carol Master just turning negative right now, giving up those gains down a point. Bottom line, though, little change. S&P holding on to a one-point gain. NASDAQ up by 13. Developing story today, Bernie Ebers, the former WorldCom CEO who is serving a 25-year prison sentence for an $11 billion fraud that bankrupted the company, has been ordered released from prison almost eight years before he was due to be freed. The 78-year-old Ebers is serving his time at a federal medical center in Fort Worth, Texas. Deutsche Bank cutting 6,000 jobs tied to its private banking division. This according to the newspaper Honda Plot, citing sources familiar with the matter. Again, stocks clinging to modest gains as investors digest a flurry of corporate news. As for the overall market backdrop, Julian Emanuel is chief equity and derivative strategist at BTIG. We knew this year was going to be a transition year for the company, but we didn't realize how ugly it was going to be for the for the company. I mean, uh, three months ago, you know, management was thought they were being conservative with their uh, guidance of eleven to thirteen dollars for the fiscal twenty twenty. Uh, they lowered that today to ten twenty five to eleven fifty. Uh, consensus is at twelve oh five. Plain and simple, they're not executing. 
And that's Arlie Glasgow, a senior logistics analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, talking about FedEx. FedEx shares lower indeed as the parcel company lowered its profit forecast for the year. Also reported quarterly results below expectations. FedEx shares plunging now by 10%. Crude, higher little change. West Texas Intermediate up 3 cents. Gold, also little change, down 28 cents. Uh, the ounce at 14.75. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thanks a lot. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Oh, Jackson Brown on this Wednesday, running on empty, leads us to the chart of the day in our own Dave Wilson. What do you got? Well, it almost seems like Berkshire Hathaway shares are kind of running on empty, oh. at least relative to its biggest holdings. You know what got me started on this? When I saw Apple stock was up like 78% this year. Biggest gain in a decade if it holds up for Apple. And, of course, that's Berkshire Hathaway's mm-hmm. biggest equity holding. So I went and looked at uh, others that uh, are relatively large for them. And when I say relatively large, we're talking $10 billion plus based on current market values. And what do you find down the line? They're doing better than Berkshire this year. Bank of America is up almost 43% as we speak. American Express is up 30%. Now, Wells Fargo and Coca-Cola aren't keeping up with the S&P 500, but they are beating Berkshire. That's sort of how that goes. Uh, Wells Fargo uh, up about 17%. Coke up 14%. Berkshire's Class B shares, the more actively traded, the ones that are in the S&P 500, only up 10% for the year. So it just goes to show you how uh, the struggles that uh, Buffett has had when it comes to deal making, you know, that that cash pile growing, you know, up to one hundred and twenty eight billion dollars at the end of the third quarter. I mean, you put it all together and it's leaving a mark on Berkshire, at least in relative terms. Now, it, it could be worse. I should point out 40 of the 49 U.S. stocks listed in Buffett's latest statement of holdings on a quarterly basis. Uh, are ahead of Berkshire. The most notable laggard would be Kraft Heinz. Those Hmm. shares down 26% this year, and it's now the sixth largest holding at Berkshire uh, based on market value, given that drop. So, you know, it's not a perfect record, but I got to tell you, you look at these numbers, I mean, Buffett and his uh, other managers, Ted Wessler and Todd Combs, doing a pretty good job of stock picking. Problem is, it hasn't really carried over to Berkshire shares. If you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it, and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. Makes me wonder if investors are missing that as well. Dave Wilson, thank you so much. His chart of the day. All right. Let's bring in Jeremy Hill now, bankruptcy and distressed debt reporter, to learn more about the Sackler family, the family behind Purdue, and in many people's minds, the family behind the opioid crisis currently uh, really gripping the nation. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be here. All right. So tell us what is going on when it comes to some money transfers, especially as all of these investigations and scrutiny were ramping up. Right. So what we learned this week is that between 2008 and 2017, at least $10 billion in cash um, came out of Purdue Pharma and in some way benefited the Sackler family. And while we had heard numbers like that in the past, what was interesting about um, this week's uh, information from court papers is we saw a little bit more of a drill down into what those distributions looked like, specifically where they went. So remind us, was Purdue Pharma a public company at any time during that transfer of money? No. No, it's been a privately held company. Even so, what does the laws, what do what are the rules and regulations to all of that from you know with a family owned entity or family co-founded entity? Well, there wasn't necessarily anything in the in the new report this week that suggested there was anything untoward about these disbursements. It was more so just um, getting a clearer picture of um, the, the kinds of cash that this business was throwing off and, and, and where it was headed. And we also learned a little bit about some of their other investments because they were invested in companies uh, you know, well beyond uh, the maker of OxyContin. 
Um, yeah, the, the the holdings of the family uh, are far flung, and they uh, range from everything from um, well, previously uh, ski resorts to oil companies and uh, skincare products. What do you think is significant about this? Because this is a story we've been following for some time now, right? At least a, a year or so, uh, and certainly unfolding as the opioid crisis unfolded as well, and we saw the impact, you know, on individuals, the economic impact, the you know, just a terrible situation. Um, what what does this story kind of what's you know, the most recent takeaway from this. Right. So so the big thing, I think, from these numbers as far as a, a concrete point moving forward is um, Purdue Pharma's in bankruptcy uh, mostly to deal with the sort of barrage of lawsuits, at least 2,700, um, that uh, targeted the company. Uh, in regards to its role in the in the national opioid crisis, and the Sackler family and Purdue have agreed. They, they've said that they'll pay at least three billion dollars and hand over the keys to Purdue to a public trust, um, or, or a trust to benefit the public. So, what we'll see now is likely states and uh, people suing the company who haven't signed on to that proposed deal using these figures as a sort of bargaining chip, right. you know, saying, we think there's more than $3 billion on offer here. Yeah, it's a really nice piece of reporting yeah. and important to understand sort of where the money has gone and where it may end up. Jeremy Hill, thank you so much. Bankruptcy and distressed debt reporter for Bloomberg here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Coming up, we're going to get you to the close of trading. We will indeed. Just got about 20 minutes to go. In the meantime, back to World of National News headlines. Back to Martin DeCaro. We go in our 991 newsroom in Washington, D.C. Hi, Martin. Thank you, Carol, debate continues in the House at this hour. Final votes on two articles of impeachment against President Trump in the Ukraine affair. Abuse of power and obstruction of Congress are expected tonight. Also tonight, President Trump will hold a campaign rally in Michigan, setting up a split-screen spectacle. The House is set to fi- vote rather final approval tomorrow on the new North American Free Trade Pact, known as USMCA. A vote in the Senate may not happen until after an impeachment trial ends. Ohio Republican Senator Rob Portman tells Bloomberg the updates to the outdated NAFTA are too important to be undercut by any impeachment bitterness. It has new digital protection. So the digital economy wasn't around 25 years ago. And so there's no provisions in the current NAFTA accord. President Trump considers replacing NAFTA one of his top priorities ahead of the 2020 election. Attorney General William Barr announced a new law enforcement effort to combat violent crime in seven cities, Detroit, Memphis, Baltimore, Kansas City, Cleveland, Milwaukee, and Albuquerque, because of their violent crime rates. We're calling it Operation Relentless Pursuit. Uh, And it's a two-pronged attack on on violent crime. Speaking in Detroit with the leaders of federal agencies, Barr says more federal law enforcers will be sent to the partner cities. Case dismissed against Paul Manafort in New York. A state Supreme Court justice dismissed the charges against the former Trump campaign manager because they overlap with cases already brought by special counsel Robert Mueller. New York pursued its case to ensure Manafort won't go free if eventually pardoned for his federal crimes by President Trump. Global news 24 hours a day on air and a quick take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Martin DeCaro. This is Bloomberg. Why has J.D. Power ranked Commonwealth Financial Network number one in independent advisor satisfaction among financial investment firms for the sixth straight time? We think it comes down to one thing. You. Because it's your input and feedback that keeps us focused on what's most important to you and your clients and continually pushes us to be the best we can be. Maybe that's why we receive top marks in every category of the J.D. Power 2019 Advisor Satisfaction Survey. They named us number one in client support, number one in firm leadership, number one in operational support, number one in compensation. Number one in professional development support and number one in technology support. Ready to partner with the best? Call Commonwealth at 866-462-3638 or visit Commonwealth.com and feel the power. Member FINRA a registered investment advisor. For 2019 J.D. Power Award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Vatzel Shah is senior project engineer at Mott McDonald, a global engineering consultancy with more than 16,000 employees. He earned his Ph.D. at New Jersey Institute of Technology and as an adjunct professor is helping NJIT students explore emerging technologies. My focus is renewable markets, emerging technologies, the idea of floating cities. 
What are we doing to develop that? What will happen to sit in the water? Well, you're going to have waves hitting it. You're going to have solar. How are you going to you know, develop plants? How are you going to develop vegetation and farming? That sort of thought process happens at NGIT. We actually plan out what will the city look like? How do we develop that? So in 10 years, we're actually ready to take on those challenges when we have our first development in the water. NGIT also has been doing a lot of work in self-healing materials. So taking the polymers and the, the new material that we have in our material sciences departments and putting them into things like concrete, things like steel, reinforcing our soil. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.ed. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. The Keenan... Search NFL today. In Washington, D.C., there's only one word in everybody's mouth. Impeachment. As the impeachment process moves on to the next stage, don't miss history unfolding on TuneIn. Wherever you are when the latest witness takes the stand, you can listen to every hearing live as it's happening on Capitol Hill. And between hearings, turn to stations like CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News Talk for bombshells, breaking headlines, and bold analysis every step of the way. Search Impeachment News on TuneIn to hear the latest. From ESPN and the award-winning producers of The Sterling Affairs comes the latest season of 30 for 30 podcasts. Four brand new stories of espionage. He wanted this team to be the Barcelona of women's basketball. Resilience. I started to scream. I tried to get away. Corruption. It's the culture of win at all costs. And rebirth. How will we ever rebuild it? 30 for 30 podcasts, season six. Listen now to 30 for 30 podcasts on TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams, starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. 
headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We've got 13 minutes to go ahead of the closing bell with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ. They're all pushing higher on this Wednesday here with the S&P right now. Higher, little changed, on track for a record close, up by two points. That's a gain of less than one-tenth of one percent. The Dow up one point has been swinging between gains and losses, was on the minus side very briefly, but up now by one point. We've got the NASDAQ Composite Index up 14. That's a gain of two-tenths of one percent. Tenure down 11.30 seconds yield right now, 1.92 percent. Gold lower, little change, down 61 cents the ounce at 14.75. West Texas Intermediate Crude also a little change, down now by one cent. Recapping, stocks at a record. S&P pushing higher up now by two points. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. Yeah, but you let me drive. Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I want to drive. Just drive, baby. Drive. It's time for the drive to the close. Now back with us via phone, Craig Hodges, CEO and portfolio manager of Hodges Funds. He oversees about $2 billion down there in the Big D, Dallas, Texas. That's where he joins us. Great to have you back with us, Craig. Hey, uh, uh, glad to be on. All right. So we're wrapping up the year. We're headed toward Christmas. How do you feel about 2019 now that all is almost all said and done? <laughs> Uh, 2019 has been a remarkable year in that I've never seen the market continue to do well in the face of pessimism, in the face of, you know, the political environment that we've had. Just you, you think about all the issues that happened over the year, and the market has been incredibly resilient. And uh, it tells you that there's a lot of money on the sidelines, and there's a lot of people that have not participated in this advance, and that, that's what's keeping it up. What makes you so sure that there's still a lot of money on the sidelines? Uh, you can look at the statistics. Unbelievably, this year, investors have pulled $220 billion out of stock mutual funds this year. That's, but there's been an $85 billion inflow into ETFs, so net 135. But there's been 277 billion inflow into bonds this mm-hmm. year, U.S. bonds. And four hundred and eighty-two billion into money market funds. That's this year. That's an eleven-year high. So, used to or you know every market sell-off and every bull market at the end of a bull market, there's euphoria, optimism, people climbing over each other to get into the market, and that is the total opposite of what we're seeing. So it's it's remarkable. And so, Craig, as you look ahead to 2020, where is uh, some opportunities? Uh, let's talk about some sectors or some names that you like. Yeah, you know, here at the Hodges Funds and, and uh, you know, in our separately managed accounts, um, we really see the opportunities in the market are, are the, the, the parts of the market that have been forgotten. Uh, you know the beat some of the beaten down names. Uh, there's a lot of beaten down uh, consumer names. There's a, a lot of uh, housing related stocks that have done okay, but not near to the uh, effect you think is as good as housing is doing now. Um, and you know there's a lot of uh, material companies and then energy. Energy you know is very controversial and it's less than you know less than five percent of the S and P now, so no one really cares about it. But it's been a, it's been the worst performing sector for two years in a row, and that is that never happens either. So. We think that's where the opportunities are in the market. Do you have specific names that you like, um, Craig, within the, in yeah. the energy space? Yeah. Yeah, in the, in the energy space, there's several. Uh, Matador Resources, a small cap, best management team in, in E&P. I like Concho, um, you know, a lot of names like that. Uh, the the one other stock that I, I would recommend that's, that's, that's had a terrible year is Cleveland Cliffs. It's the uh, iron ore producer, mm-hmm. stock down from about 11 into the $8 range. But they just, they just acquired AK Steel. Um, but 
that, that they're, they've, they've invested in, in their business for about the last three years, and those are finally starting to pay off. You're going to see great free cash flow in that company. Um, the company's very, very well run. And, you know, iron ore is, is essential for, you know, all the things that, you know, all the building that we're going to need to do in this country and infrastructure-wise. So um, I think Cleveland Cliffs uh, is a very good opportunity. And in, the, in that housing area, our favorite buy is Century Communities. It's an entry-level home builder. Stock's corrected about 20 25 percent here just in the last month or so a big disconnect there but uh they're in they're in the hottest markets uh colorado texas uh nevada georgia right you know some of those so so craig uh, talk to me about semiconductors because you are just i'm guessing down the road uh from texas instruments obviously a big name there we're going to hear from micron after mm-hmm. the close of trading in just a few minutes actually what do you make of the chip space right now you know, it's 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 it, recently it's done very very well, and there's been a lot of skepticism. And a lot of people think that uh, you know the cycle. You know, we were kind of near a bottom. Yeah. But it 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 looks like things are improving there. I think that's that's I think most of the prices tell you that it's going to or you know that we've kind of the worst is behind it. But there there has been a whole lot of optimism there. But I, but we like Micron. We like uh, NXP, uh, Tower Semiconductor, or some names that that we think uh, are, are situated in the right parts of the of the semiconductor business. So it's interesting, too. Um, I, I'm curious, have you been putting a lot of new money to work, or are you waiting for a better entry point considering the bump-up that we've seen, uh, whether it's big caps uh, or small caps? Yes. Um, you know, w- we just don't fly in with both feet when when money shows up. We're yeah. looking for we're trying to be opportunistic. And you know, even though I am bullish and I think the market will do well next year, we will have sell offs, and those some of those sell offs will be will be upsetting. But when the Fed's on the sideline like they are, and they're saying they're not going to raise rates until inflation, you know, becomes a problem, we're a long way from that. So mm-hmm. the Fed's on our side for the for the future, and I would just be opportunistic when when the good companies go on sale. You know, go in there and buy them. I, I wouldn't be jumping in with both feet here, like I said, but just be opportunistic. And when you think about the Fed, did you feel like the Fed was on your side all year, or is that a relatively new phenomenon, Craig? Well, just seeing the Fed, you know, a year ago, what they were doing, where they were raising rates, and then <laughs> they were not totally, on your side. They were not no, on anybody's were, side. It feels like yeah, a year ago, and that's why there was that twenty twenty percent decline right at year end. But you know, it's and it's taken some while to, uh, for people to get more comfortable. But you know, the last, the last statements by the Fed were is that you know they are they're going to sit on the sidelines and not do anything until and inflation becomes a problem. And let me tell you, we're a long way from that. I got to ask you about your blue chip fund. Um, And this is names like Apple, Microsoft, Boeing. Mm -hmm. I am curious about Boeing, uh, only up about 2.6%. We all know the story behind Boeing. In fact, there's a great story in right through um, in the magazine this week that's hitting newsstands tomorrow. But what's interesting is I'm curious as... Shares of Boeing have been under pressure. I think it's like your number three, one of your top you know, holdings mm-hmm. in that blue chip fund. Have you been adding to the position? Just got about 30 seconds here. Uh, we haven't, but we will add to it. But let's be honest; they ha- they have their problems, and you know, this uh, at the first month of the of the year, it was the number one uh, stock acting in the whole market. And then we had those disasters happen, which were terrible. But let's not forget, it is a duopoly. They're the only business in town. They're the greatest manufacturer probably in the world. So don't count Boeing out yet. Hmm. All right. Well, interesting. We'll be watching that one for sure as we get into 2020. Always great to catch up with you. Craig Hodges, CEO and Portfolio Manager for the Hodges Funds, looking after about $2 billion down there in Dallas, Texas, as they say down south. Come see us. Uh, Always good to catch up with you. Well, coming up, we're going to get you to the close of trading. We're going to be on the lookout for Micron as well. Stock's essentially flat. The NASDAQ up about one-tenth of one percent, but the S&P and the Dow are steady state. This is when you start to feel the holidays, right? There's not any really big headlines, I feel like, coming out of the nation's capital. I feel like we haven't really talked trade. Except they're voting on impeachment. Yeah, they Oh, yeah, they are doing that. Uh, So we're watching that, but a lot of investors might tell you, "Mm, not necessarily keep an eye. Anyway, stick around. We've got the closing bell in just a few minutes. This housework. If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. 
Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. This is the TuneIn Newsreel with the top news stories from today. FedEx missed estimates for its quarterly report and set its full year forecast lower. Amazon stopping some deliveries, one reason. But its CFO told CNBC that the delivery company expects to, quote, lap Amazon in 2021 because of its investments in seven-day delivery. Shares are down 10%. General Mills is up 2%. It beat estimates for the quarter on strong pet food demand. Fannie Mae, the mortgage agency, is boosting its new home forecast for 2020 significantly, but it's far below the pre-recession high. Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot agreeing to a $50 billion merger, creating the world's fourth biggest car maker and promising big cost savings, but no plant closures. Hear breaking news as it happens with live around-the-clock coverage from CNBC on TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Back to throw, fires, run on the slant, caught, touchdown! He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! This Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the lights shine bright on the Las Vegas Bowl. Washington Huskies head coach Chris Peterson will coach his final game before retiring as he takes on his former school, the Boise State Broncos. Down to the five, he leaps for the end zone, and he is in! To listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. From ESPN and the award-winning producers of The Sterling Affairs comes the latest season of 30 for 30 podcasts. Four brand new stories of espionage. He wanted this team to be the Barcelona of women's basketball. Resilience. I started to scream. I tried to get away. Corruption. It's the culture of win at all costs. And rebirth. How will we ever rebuild it? 30 for 30 podcasts, season six. Listen in favorite 30 for 30 podcasts on TuneIn of the world 24 hours a day at bloomberg.com on the bloomberg business app and on quick take by bloomberg this is bloomberg radio markets headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at bloomberg.com the bloomberg business app and on quick take by bloomberg this is a bloomberg business plan from bloomberg world headquarters i'm charlie pellet a retreat from records at the closing bell folks from micro sectors and bemo ringing that closing bell as we await the latest numbers out of micron technology it is a down day for the s&p 500 index falling right in the close final couple of minutes of trading down one point to 3191 down less than one tenth of one percent the dow slumping 23 points at the close down about one tenth of one percent nasdaq record close there little changed up four points to 88.27 tenure down 11 30 seconds yield there 1.92 percent so stocks uh moving a little change today as investors digested a flurry of corporate news impeachment loomed and trade worries retreated craig hodges is co-portfolio manager of the Hodges Fund. He was interviewed moments ago right here on Bloomberg Business Week. You think about all the issues that happened over the year, and the market has been incredibly resilient. And uh, it tells you that there's a lot of money on the sidelines, and there's a lot of people that have not participated in this advance, and that, that's what's keeping it up. Well, keeping it down today, FedEx dropping 10%. FedEx declined as the parcel company lowered its profit forecast for the year and reported quarterly results below expectations, prompting Wall Street analysts to wonder if the situation can worsen. Again, FedEx shares dropping today down by 10%. Bernie Ebers, the former WorldCom CEO who's serving a 25-year prison sentence for an $11 billion fraud that bankrupt the company, has been ordered released from prison almost eight years before he was due to be freed, 78-year-old Everett.
Evers is serving his time at the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. The tenure, as we mentioned, down to 11.30 seconds, yield 1.92% gold. Little change down 82 cents the ounce. West Texas Intermediate Crude up 3 cents. Also little change, 60.97 a barrel. So again, recapping, both the Dow and S&P retreat from records. NASDAQ are by 4. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Move around. Motion creates the motion. I feel the earth move under my feet. You move like they do. I've never seen anyone move that fast. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Something's called Movers and Shakers. They cost a little more. <laughs> that name cracked me up. Bloomberg Business Week. Movers and Shakers with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly on Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed. Time to take a look at some of the movers and shakers on this Wednesday. Carol Master, along with Jason Kelly in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Micron Technology, folks, uh, as Jason mentioned, out with their earnings. And we are seeing, let's see if the stock, a little bit higher. Actually up now about 4%. So getting a big bump up. Let's take you through the numbers. Uh, reporting its first quarter adjusted EPS, a penny better than Wall Street was forecasting. That coming in at $0.48 cents a share. First quarter adjusted revenue coming in a little bit stronger, $5.14 billion versus an estimate that was $5 billion even. And the gross margin approving, uh, improving, excuse me, for the first quarter as yeah. well. 27.3% versus an estimate of 26.8%. And then the outlook, Jason, they're saying second quarter revenue of 4.5 to $4.8 billion. We'll look for some comparison, but right now the street liking what it got from the company. Yeah, so far so good when it comes to Micron. As you say, the stock holding its gains in the after hour, uh, after hours trading, yeah, I should say. It mm-hmm. was was bouncing around when the numbers initially came out. Uh, could be that it is trading upward on those forecast numbers. So we'll keep it's up looking at that. Seven percent this year. We know a lot of these chip names, right, have really had uh, a bullish year. Well, and I wanted, and I know we're going to get to the big picture in a second, but I did want to talk about the chipsters uh, if I could for mm-hmm. a second because Morgan Stanley came out earlier, uh, interestingly lifting its uh, stance on chips after this huge rally this year, uh, Broadcom and NVIDIA names uh, named as stocks by Morgan Stanley that may outperform more. The analysts over there are essentially saying, we were wrong about this. They were cautious on the semiconductor sector. They have now upgraded their thoughts to in line. And, you know, I was taking a look at this when we were talking to Craig Hodges Mm -hmm. and the SOX, the Philadelphia Mm -hmm. Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, I always have a hard time saying that, uh, it is up 58% this yeah. year. So you thought the S&P was having a good year? Even better on the Sox. Well, and we you know, typically look at what's going on in the chip names, and not every chip name is the same, but it really is often an indicator. People are, you know, there's chips in everything, right? Yeah. And so if there's some optimism, uh, that tends to portend well for kind of the overall economic outlook. And, and Micron the outlook. is in so many. I mean, it's one it's of the one. reasons that we like to talk about the name so much is they make memory chips. They're in so many things, as you say, so many electronics. So it's a broad gauge of consumer electronic demand. FedEx, uh, I know Charlie uh, Pellet's been talking about this throughout the day, and rightfully so. Uh, we were breaking down their earnings after the close 24 hours ago. Uh, that stock was your number one decliner in the S&P 500, down 10%. And this had to do certainly with the company's profit outlook. Uh, and there were some concerns on that. In fact, it, it I think it dragged down the whole uh, Dow Jones transportation uh, average. Uh, it's a big weighting, obviously, in that. But anyway, uh, concerned about cutting its outlook, and that certainly had some worries among the investment community. did want to go back to one name you mentioned earlier in the show, which was Tesla. That name finishing up 3.7%. And as Dave Wilson pointed out, uh, they're at the top of the two, getting closer and closer now. <laughs> it's at 393, close yeah. to 393.15, getting closer and closer to that magic 420. Yeah, exactly. 420, which, you know, everybody's like, oh, what does it mean? Um, FedEx, I do want to point out that they did say yesterday that the Amazon ground contract expired in August. That was from the CFO. So, you know, we certainly have had several months. Numbers, right, yeah. exactly. You know, the news came out just, what, the day before um, publicly, but you you realize that it definitely was playing out in those FedEx numbers. Let's do the VIX. Let's do it. Volatility up a touch today. Uh, up the VIX was about 2.8% closing at 12.63. This is Bloomberg. All right, Dave, you're up. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Dave. Wilson, where are you? Wilson! Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? We're going for a price on Wilson. Open up the door, it's Dave! Who? Dave! Hey, Mr. And the aforementioned Dave Wilson back with us with his stock of the day. What you looking at, Dave? I am looking at Unity Group, Jason. It's a real estate investment trust that specializes in communications. The Reed owns fiber optic lines and wireless towers and leases them to phone companies, notably Windstream Holdings, which spun it off in 2015. Now, Unity is spelled U-N-I-T-I. Of course it is. Naturally. The ticker, though, is pretty straightforward. It's the first four letters of the name, Unit. UNIT. The shares are on track for a third straight annual loss, and this one is sure to be steeper than the others. Unity has plunged as much as 66% this year, reflecting Windstream's Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing in March. Now, Windstream's seeking to rework a lease agreement, which requires an annual payment of $650 million. The company's failed to reach a deal through mediation, and a trial has been set for March. Now, today was a different story for Unity, thanks to the keepers of the S&P Small Cap 600 Index. The company will join a benchmark before Monday's opening bell, and that means funds tracking the Small Cap 600 will have to own shares. Now, that leads to what's called the index effect. And it certainly seems to have played out with Unity today. I mean, the shares initially rose more than 16%. They gave back a fair amount of that gain. Nonetheless, closing higher by 8% on the day. All right, that's a good name. And just bringing you one headline that is crossing the Bloomberg right now. Just got a read spike. A snow squall. It was so nice out (laughs) earlier. I mean, it was cold. A snow squall is sweeping across New York, may cause some whiteouts. Uh, It's getting dark already. So just if you're out there driving, be very careful. I just saw a text cross about uh, our teenager who's driving. My wife saying, be very, very careful. Because it really, you know, given how cold it's been, the ice and everything. So if you're driving out there in the New York City area, be very, very careful because the weather turned very quickly and you could see some whiteouts across the tri-state area. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, Micron right now is up about 4% in the after hours and Western Digital also bumping up on the news. It's up about 2.7%, so two names to watch in tomorrow's session. And more coming up on Micron. We're going to check in with Ed Ludlow out in San Francisco. Also get an update on impeachment as well from Ryan Teague Beckwith. He's going to join us from D.C. But first, speaking of the nation's capital, let's get down there to Martin DeCaro. He's got world and national headlines. Hi, Martin. That's right, Jason. In one or two minute bursts, Republicans and Democrats are trading party line barbs on the floor of the House of Representatives right now. It's the final hours of debate before a historic vote on the impeachment of President Donald Trump. Live to Capitol Hill and Bloomberg's Irv Chapman. Martin, members of the investigating committees have had their say. Now it's the turn of many others. Republican Chris Stewart said the Democrats are acting out of hatred for President Trump and all who voted for him. Some people don't like President Trump. They think he's loud. They think he can be arrogant. They think sometimes he says bad words and sometimes he's rude to people. And to their sensitive natures, they've been offended. Democrat Hakeem Jeffries. We will hold this president accountable for his stunning abuse of power. We will hold this president accountable for undermining our national security. We will hold this president accountable. We will impeach Donald John Trump. Preliminary votes have been along party lines. The final vote to impeach is likely to be much the same, Martin. That's right, Irv. And while the House is expected to make Trump only the third president ever impeached tonight, president will be holding a campaign rally in Michigan. The administration is trying to bar immigrants convicted of certain crimes from claiming asylum. The plan would add to existing restrictions. It lists seven criminal categories, including convictions for illegally re-entering the U.S. and drunk driving, but also make it harder for immigration judges to reconsider some asylum denials. Meanwhile, two liberal legal groups are suing the administration, claiming it's turned the immigration court system into a deportation machine. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and a quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Martin DeCaro. In the real world, there are no rabbits in hats, crystal balls, or cards that turn into money. 
Instead, you get business information from top-tier analysts and experts. What should expectations be for this latest round of negotiations? That's actually better, isn't it? They're both trying to say they have the upper hand. Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney and Lisa Abramowitz. Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. What if you could keep the top economic experts in a conference room next to your office without having to feed them? Do we need better optics? Do we need some substance? Do CEOs care about ESG? We have seen quite a lot of stimulus pumped into the system already. It's the biggest warning yet about the financial risks of climate change. Now, there are more ways to hear us. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com and iHeartRadio apps, and at BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Sweet strawberry icing. You're in goodwill and just past that vintage denim jacket you spot. Miniature donut earrings. You lean in. Ah, that's the scent of shopping success. Because at Goodwill, every item you buy funds local job training and more. So bring home those donut earrings and bring home so much good to your community. Goodwill. Bring good home. Brought to you by Goodwill and the... Ho, ho, ho! Who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days t's and c's apply want tune in to remind you when the big nfl game is about to get underway be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search nfl on the tuning app find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me we'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff today for only the third time in history the house of representatives votes on whether to impeach the sitting president of the united states of america the judiciary committee will come to order a quorum being present having agreed yesterday to the amendment in the nature of a substitute on articles of impeachment against president donald j trump pending business is reporting the resolution favorably to the house be there for the vote and instant analysis of what happens next with live coverage from cnn msnbc fox news talk and more search impeachment on tune in to be a part of history Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. To Keenan. Search NFL today. Do you have a favorite true crime podcast this year? Here's a few of ours. On the latest season of Uncover, journalist Michelle Shepard investigates the unsolved case of a missing Toronto teen that has haunted her for 20 Toronto years. Toronto police are continuing a desperate search for a missing... And on Haunting Warhead, host Damon Fairless exposes the darkest, most shocking corners of the internet and the criminals who lurk in the shadows. How do you take down a criminal network? Hidden in the shadows. Search true crime on TuneIn to discover these and more life thrillers. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Slam dunk! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Four of the league's top teams are in action as the Lakers take on the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, followed by the Rockets taking on the Clippers at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. 11 to 2! This Thursday, the Lakers are at the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, and the Rockets are at the Clippers, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. 
Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Back to throw, fires, run on the slant, caught, touchdown! He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! This Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the lights shine bright on the Las Vegas Bowl. Washington Huskies head coach Chris Peterson will coach his final game before retiring as he takes on his former school, the Boise State Broncos. Down to the five, he leaps for the end zone, and he is in! To listen to this and every bowl game, just search college football today. In breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. A mix of finish to the Wednesday session with the Dow, the SP retreating from records, NASDAQ up another four points, record close there at 88.27, up by less than one tenth of one percent. But the SP 500 index declined after spending most of the session higher, snapping a five session streak of gains. S&P down a point. The Dow down 27, a drop there of one-tenth of one percent. After the bell, we heard from Micron Technology. Shares trading higher, up three and a half percent. It reported adjusted earnings per share for the first quarter that beat the average analyst estimate. Tenure down 13, 30 seconds with a yield of 1.92 percent this Wednesday. Gold lower little change down a dollar 25 the ounce. That's a drop of one-tenth of one percent. And West Texas Intermediate Crude turning higher up a three cents, six 97 a barrel, Brent crude 66.20. Recapping, stocks lower, S&P down a point. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, along with Jason Kelly, right here on Bloomberg Radio. Gonna keep on ground certainly for micron investors those shares up in the aftermarket just getting a quick check up about three and a half uh four percent depending on when we're checking in 3.6 percent at this very second ed ludlow tech reporter for bloomberg joining us from our 960 studio in san francisco breaking it down so ed what are investors excited about here It seems like it's a stronger than expected forecast for this current fiscal quarter. And really, like, it's a bigger picture question about demand for memory chips, because, you know, that at the end of the day, that is what Micron does. It makes memory chips. Um, And if you guys want to get really nerdy, we're talking about DRAM, dynamic random access memory. And that's essentially what we're referring to. DRAM, come on. DRAM. Come on. Hang with the cool kids. Come on, Ed. You're in San Francisco now, Ed. DRAM. Okay, for for those that don't know, that's what we're we're referring to when we talk about the memory in a computer or a tablet or a smartphone. And what's been happening over the last two years, and actually longer than that, is that DRAM prices, which trade like a commodity, basically, have just been trickling down. And Wall Street's been asking, when are we going to bottom out? And even though there's been price pressure on DRAM, shares of Micron have, have done really well in recent weeks. And basically, and this seems to just be looking past the current fiscal period towards the second half of next year. And it's all these exciting things that you, you and I talk about all the time, right? Data centers and IT infrastructure and new handsets and all of those things need DRAM. They need more memory for faster processing. And so what Wall Street's basically saying is let's look ahead to the second quarter of next, uh, second half, sorry, of next year where we expect demand for those products to increase. And that should, all being well, boost profit for Micron. And I feel like, and I know Jason knows this really well, but like when you're talking about the chip, chip stocks and the chip names and the chip industry, you've got to think about where we are in the cycle because yes. that's a big part of it. So where are we and what does this tell us when we get kind of a stock reaction uh, to this quarter? So I think the, the kind of reaction on the stock as it is now and after hours would indicate that people think, yes, we have bottomed out and that actually, you know, going forward, we'll see prices come back up, demand from different product areas come back up. One On the strategy side, on the company-specific side, one of the thing Micron, things Micron's done is to diversify the types of chips it's selling into different business areas so that it's not as vulnerable, essentially, to the cycle, that it can basically be strong on a more stable basis. And that has been a big story for Micron about about not knowing where growth is going to come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a difficult one, partly because uh, there's your company-specific story and then your, there's your macro picture. Right. Okay, And on the macro side, this is what you, we were talking about recently, is that 
it's linked to how much there's going to be in terms of spending on PCs, how confident businesses is investing in data centers. Because when that confidence starts to trickle through, the data centers look at what they need to order and say, yeah, you know what, guys, let's get some DRAM in. Because we think that our customer base is positive and that we're going to be taking orders going forward. Micron on the company side has kind of looked at that and said, we need to be selling to different businesses. And so, Ed, as you talk to our colleagues out there, like the great Ian King and mm. others, how optimistic? I mean, Ian King is never optimistic about anything. I know the guy well. It's part of his uh, <laughs> part of his jam. He's got an Eeyore vibe around him. I would say that to his face. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I just said it on the radio. When you think about the broader chip market, it's had an amazing run. Uh, you know, you look at the socks, you look at some of the individual mm. names. Mm. Is the sentiment pretty positive for chips overall? That's actually a really good question because despite all of the concern about trade and actually some quite disappointing numbers across the industry in this fiscal year, if you look at what Wall Street's looking for next year, there isn't the same level of excitement in terms of where the stocks can go. And one of that is partly because multiples are a a decade high. And the question is, how can we possibly go any higher? Um, The the two unknowns are still trade and Huawei on the IP IP and security side. You know, we just got news on Micron, actually, that it's been granted some limited licenses to sell to Huawei, which is really positive news for that stock. You know, the trade discussions are incremental. and And I think I've heard some of the industry participants come on this show and talk about until we have actual action from China in meeting what's agreed or we have a real written agreement, then it's actually hard to know how positive that news is for um, chip stocks, partly because all of these companies that they're servicing in China, they they have inventories that are built up. There aren't actually any real signs that forward orders are yet coming right. through. So it's a really tricky one to read. But going into the year, the, the excitement is muted, partly because of how well the SOX has done this year. Right. Well, and it's interesting. We caught up with the chief uh, security officer over at Huawei just Huawei last USA. week, at yeah. Huawei uh, North America, and uh, he was, you know, talking about that uncertainty when it comes to their products. I know that that's yeah. a story you followed uh, very closely as well, Ed. While we have you here, a little bit mm. of a curveball, Tesla. I know that that's yeah. a, a stock and a company you followed very closely. What do you make of this run that it's had uh, over the last few days? Uh, well, so the first thing, the first joke that everyone goes is, is the next step 420. Oh, I was referring on. to Elon Musk's tweet about taking the company private at 420. But at the end of the day, like, if you read the analyst notes, it's about, do you consider Tesla to be a technology company or do you consider Tesla to be a car company? And at the end of the day, if you judge them on their numbers, you know, in terms of deliveries um, and production, then they're just going about their business now. Things have kind of quietened down. Um, we got some news out from China that they're considering cutting the price of the China-built Model 3s by almost a fifth, according to sources. You know, that's an interesting strategy. And 2020 is basically a year of expansion. You have Model Y coming. Don't forget that the one millionth Tesla is going to be delivered next year. You know, that's quite a feat. And look at what the legacy automakers are doing. They're nowhere near in terms of those numbers. So I think things have got a bit quiet on the kind of crazy side of things, the kind of big PR side of things. And people are looking to next year. They're looking at China. They're looking at Europe. And they're looking at Model Y because SUVs are so important yeah. in that space. And I think next year is a key one because there's more and more competition in the EV space uh, coming on. 2020, look at Micron, look at Tesla, look at so much more. We're going to be looking to Ed Ludlow, yes. as we do. Tech reporter at Bloomberg joining us from our 960 studio out there at the city by the bay, in the city by the bay. Coming up, we're going to go to Washington, get an impeachment update. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Market Minute. Stocks finished little changed after a late pullback erased most of what had been very narrow gains. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 28, the S&P 500 lost 1, the Nasdaq Composite managed a 4-point gain. Cigna gained more than 2%. New York Life will spend over $6 billion to acquire Cigna's group life and disability coverage business. For Cigna, the deal generates significant cash that it will use to buy back stock and repay debt. Fiat Chrysler and France's PSA Peugeot have made it official. They've signed a merger agreement that will create the world's fourth largest automaker. Each company will own half of the combined business, which will surpass Ford in market value. High Ridge Brands has filed for bankruptcy. While you may not know the name, many of its brands are familiar, including Zest Soap, Binaca Breath Freshener, and VO5 Shampoo. The company plans to sell itself and is in talks with potential bidders. 
Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. The Bloomberg Business of Sports podcast. How did the Yankees become this mega valuable team? Where the money is flowing inside sports around the globe. From the marketing perspective, where are the dollars spent? From union heads to team owners, Scott Soshnick and Michael Barr speak to the names that power this multi-billion dollar industry. Boston Red Sox CEO Sam Kennedy. National Hockey League Commissioner Gary Bettman. Bloomberg Business of Sports. Listen today on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Four of the league's top teams are in action as the Lakers take on the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, followed by the Rockets taking on the Clippers at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. 11 to 2. This Thursday, the Lakers are at the Bucks at 8 p.m. Eastern, and the Rockets are at the Clippers 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. 